Today's episode, we had a real astronaut on the show. Mike Massimino came on the show. This guy's amazing. He's first off, the first person to tweet from space. That's true. He actually was in space, sent a tweet down, and it was on, uh, at the time, named Twitter. He's done space, I think four spacewalks. He went up to fix the Hubble telescope. In fact, in today's podcast, he talks about something that might be of alien origin. No joke, no joke. This is really cool. Really cool conversation. Really great, great guy. He just released the book. You got to check it out. It's called Moonshot, a NASA astronaut's guide to achieving the impossible. So we know you're going to enjoy this episode. Also, one more thing. We have a three-part training series for trainers and coaches. I'm actually teaching trainers and coaches how to be more successful. Uh, it's happening. The first one is happening January 15th. And if you want to sign up, it's mindpumptrainer.com. Right now, there are openings. So go there before we run out of space. Today's giveaway is MAPS Anabolic Advanced. Here's how you can win that. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We also have a sale going on. MAPS Old Time Strength is 50% off and MAPS OCR is also 50% off. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Mike, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks uh, thanks for having me, Sal. I appreciate it. Look, before, <laughs> we, get, you before we get going, because I mean, yeah. there's so many questions. We have. There's, I, I need We need your help yeah. to settle a bet. We got a big bet going on. <laughs> oh, you go right, right to the bet? <laughs> and finally, on this? We got to start with this. Finally, yeah. we got a real astronaut that we could talk to. Yeah. So, okay, we, this would be a huge bet, huge problem. Right. Moon landing, real or fake? No, that was real. Ah, ah, there you go. Ah. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask me something else. Don't worry, we got other ones right, we're going to get to. No, I think there's a few was. things you're going to settle today. So no, no, that was that was. My, I mean, why, let me ask you this: Why do you guys ask that question? You it, think it's just impossible? We're why? joking. We know. Oh, we you're know joking. Okay, yeah, all right. Because yeah, yeah. sometimes people think it's like impossible. It could really never happen. Was it a conspiracy thing? No, or, no, no. There is. Like so, first of all, a little background on these guys, especially Justin. Mm -hmm. Justin loves conspiracy theories, just for fun. Just for fun. So we it's share like a lot of entertaining yeah. pastime. I and I actually had never even heard that as a conspiracy until literally like two months ago. Yeah. And they go, have you ever looked into the moon landing? And I'm like, <laughs> why would I even look into it? Like, you, are you sure it happened? And so then they started messing with me yeah. and sending me yeah. all these videos of all the conspiracy yeah. theories that were around it. And part of, I guess, the where it gets some sort of legs is obviously we're in a, a, a massive race at that time and it would... Mm -hmm be in the country's best interest to make sure that we won, even to the point where they would potentially that, fake it. That's why it's so yeah. fun. Whenever there's a little bit where you're like, oh, that could happen, you know. Yeah, I, it's just, I, you know, I, no, it really did happen. Of course. I mean, I was only six years old when it happened. Yeah. Uh, you guys, I don't think we're even, a, no. you know, way before no, we you guys were Doug born, was right? only we're 35 when I happened. Yeah, you guys, you guys. <laughs> yeah, Doug was, <laughs> poor Doug. All yeah. right, so I was uh, the only guy here that was, that was there at the, to be able to watch it at least, but. Uh, no, they actually, they actually really, uh, did that. I think looking, looking back on it and knowing what I know about NASA, I think it'd be a lot harder to fake it than actually do it. I bet they might've thought about faking it yeah. and they're like, oh man, that's too tough. Let's just go and do it. That's easier. <laughs> it's how do you cover something like that? You know, like someone's yeah. going to, you have 400,000 people working on it, Yeah, uh, that they, you know, they couldn't cover it up. But I, yeah. the thought went through my mind, like, you know, right before launch, looking up at the rocket ship, like. Well, if we want to fake this, I'll be okay with it. You know, why don't we just, I, won't, I won't tell anybody, but we got on board and we, they actually do blast people off into space. And it's, uh, you, you get there and you look back at the planet and you're like, wow. That's they, crazy. They, actually, well, they the really do this. The first yeah. time, what was that like? The very yeah. first time you look back at the planet, that had to have been a super memorable moment. It had moment. to be emotional, Yeah, right? it's, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it, 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 it really is uh, beyond words. And um, what really was impactful for me was... Uh, going out on a spacewalk so because when you first get to space like say we're in a, if we were this was a spaceship this would be a pretty cool spaceship yeah. actually right <laughs> yeah we have some windows and stuff and then we launch into space and we get there and you start floating around you look out the window but we're still kind of inside you mm -hmm. know what I mean? you're still inside the spaceship when we went outside it's now you're, you're like you're going out in the playground and the whole sky opens up and you can look around a little bit so going out in the spacewalk was looking around in the in the universe, really, you know, you're now not looking through a window and you're wearing life support, you're wearing a big space suit. So you're not wearing regular clothes. You're out there and you're, it's kind of like being a, looking at the aquarium. Uh, look, I was at the Monterey Bay Aquarium last night, right? Beautiful place looking at the pretty fish. 
and you're admiring them through glass sort of, but or as opposed to being a scuba diver where you're actually interacting with that mm -hmm. environment. So once I got out there, I felt like a real spaceman. And then looking at the planet from that vantage point, and we were a, a pretty high, Hubble had a pretty high orbit, right? One on my, uh, my mission. So we could see the curve of the planet. And uh, when I really had a chance to look, uh, the thought, the thought went through my mind was, uh, this is a, this is like a view from heaven, right? This is what you would look down and see our planet. And then that was replaced by another thought, which was, no, nah, it's more beautiful than that. This is what heaven must look like. Mm, wow. And I felt like I was looking into absolute paradise and it's changed the way I think about our planet. I, I, I do think we're living in an absolute paradise. You know, I don't know what, what heaven could be, but I, I think that I can't imagine any place more beautiful than where we are right now. How, how, and just even like to drive over here, I came up from Monterey, taking the drive up to see you guys. Just the beauty, right? It was on the Highway 101, right? It wasn't even on the coast, but just the farmland and the smells of the planet. We went through the garlic town there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Kilroy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, just like the, the planet is so alive and so beautiful and, and having all the people around us and the joy that is possible here uh, is is really uh, quite remarkable. Do you, do you, I, do, I do think we're living in a, in a wonderful place. Do you find an experience like that for the, the people, the few people that have been able to have that experience? Does it make someone more or less spiritual? Uh, I don't, I don't think it, in my opinion on this, uh, Adam, is that like, whether or not you're spiritual or religious, I, I, I don't know if space changes that. I, I think it's more, this is my opinion on this. Yeah is that what I've noticed with some of my, my crewmates, because some were extremely religious and some were absolutely uh, not, not believers, yeah. you know? And, and, you know, I think it, it's not that, it, it didn't necessarily change anybody's opinion. It's just, I think, the way we look at the world. So if someone is a spiritual person or someone is a religious person, and I don't think you have to be religious to be spiritual, right? you could be whatever you want or not, not a non-believer, let's say, whatever. I, I think that's the way they interpret the world. So- uh, some people might see it as God's creation or some people might see it as a spiritual experience that may or may not include a religious aspect to it. And some people without any religious thought, I th can look at it and interpret it in their way. Yeah. So I, just my observation with that, at least with astronauts, I don't think it's necessarily changed the way people think about it. It's just your belief system, I think, allows you to interpret things. That's what I was curious about, if it actually would yeah. change somebody. Somebody that went up there and said, oh, not that they don't believe at all. And they're like, oh, my God, how could I not believe? Or vice versa. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, they're like, oh, that's not what I thought. That, I, that I haven't noticed. Maybe it's, you know, the just the folks that, by the time you get to fly in space, you're usually a little bit older. You know, you're an adult in your 30s, at least, maybe 40s, more likely. And and maybe you've already come to conclusions about what you think about mm -hmm. things. and. And I think what you see, when you see these things, I think your background or your belief system will help you to interpret it. I, I think the thing that changed about it, what changed me, the things that changed about me, I, one thing is I've, I do believe, that not that it changed my, my, my thinking spiritually, but I do believe we are living in a paradise and we need to take advantage of it every moment that we, that we can. Um, the other thing that changed uh, was when I think of home. It was, it's, it's different now. Uh, that changed for me. Awesome. So, so like, when I was a when I was a little kid, I grew up just outside of Queens, New York City, in a town called Franklin Square, and we really didn't go anywhere. You know, we would go visit our relatives in in Brooklyn. That was a big deal. The Bronx was even worse because you had to go over a bridge. That was pretty much it. We didn't really go anywhere. Mm. So my neighborhood was kind of my world, and my school became my world, and that was my my town. And then when I went to college, it was more more. And when I traveled around the country a little bit more as I got older, I was more a New Yorker. I kind of identified myself as a New Yorker. And I became an astronaut, went to work with the American flag on my arm. I felt like I was an American. You know, I'm, I identified home as being the United States. But after traveling around the planet over and over again, when I think of home now, I, I think of I think of Earth. Wow. Because I could see the planet and realize that everything that I knew was there, everything that everybody, every human was was in that one place. And uh, it takes 90 minutes, half, uh, an hour and a half, to do one complete orbit of our planet and everything that we know is there. Everything that's happened before has happened there. Everything that's going to happen in the future in our families and so on, that is going to focus right there on that one place. And that's a home that we all share. So now when I, when I think of home, I think of earth much more broad. So that's kind of weird. Yeah. That's, that's, that's kind of a weird thing. I think I'm from planet earth. <laughs> that's, that's, awesome. that's how I think of home. What are some of the biggest uh, misunderstandings with like space walking and going out there? Like what are some things that people just don't realize or, or maybe misunderstand about the process? 
Um, I, I the first thing that popped into my mind, and it's I know you, you guys are a fitness uh, show, but it's kind of hard. You know, it's not like just floating around having fun, and uh, it's something that people really want to do. Uh, as as astronauts, I, I think it's the coolest thing you could do is go out for a spacewalk. But it is it is not easy and moving around in a spacesuit that's pretty bulky. The training for it takes place underwater. So I felt like I was, I just, you know, I got my butt kicked after my first training run in the pool, moving and trying to manipulate that big suit and move around. Uh, that was, to me, that was the, the, the first thing that sunk in is that this is, this is not an easy thing to do. People always talk about like, at least the astronauts do, you get the impression, oh, this is fun. This is what you want to do. And it is, it's, it's awesome, but it's, it's really challenging. And, and it was uh, challenging for me to, to get to a level where I was good enough to be able to perform on a, on a complicated spacewalk mission like the Hubble missions that we had. So that's that's one thing. I think the other thing that that sticks out when I think about it was how well trained we were. Yeah, you know, uh like the the training we did was 18 hours in the pool underwater training for every hour we did in space. Oh, wow. So we thought of every little thing. You were trying to always save a minute here, a minute there. Um and we were so well prepared. Uh, I didn't necessarily believe that when I was getting ready to go to space. I thought, like, I'm not really ready. <laughs> you know, I, you never really believe you're ready for things. But when you're well-trained and you prepare, uh, you are. You have to believe that. You have to believe in your training. You have to trust your training, trust the gear that's going to get you there. It's going to help you perform. Trust your team and trust yourself to to perform. And I was, I didn't really believe that that was going to be – I didn't really believe that I was well-trained. But once I got to space, I was amazed at how well, well trained I was to do the task. I remember looking at the Hubble, my very first spacewalk, closing a door to a reaction wheel replacement. A reaction wheel spins and points a telescope. And I remember closing the door. And as I was doing that, I realized that's the very first time I had seen the Hubble for real. Um, because I, I wasn't with NASA when they built it or launched it. I'd never seen it. I'd never been to, in space before. I'd never been to the Hubble before, of course. But yet I felt like I had done that task a hundred times because I had been so well trained to do it. So there's a huge amount of training that goes into it. And maybe the last thing here is with all that training, there's nothing that can prepare you for what you're going to see yeah. outside of the yeah. outside of looking at the spaceship and so on, which you feel comfortable with. But the view of that planet is just really overwhelming. So I want to know some of those details in terms of uh, how you're able to overcome like some of the dexterity mm -hmm. with the suit and yeah. uh, I mean, what you're actually responsible for in terms of, uh, fixing things and mm -hmm. like the knowledge that you have to have in, in terms of, uh, like you said, being better prepared even mm -hmm. to get up there yeah. uh, and, and be a bit predictive in terms of like possible like things that could go wrong. Right, right. So as as, as the things that can go wrong, what we would do is uh, we'd practice like crazy, right? So a lot of the training wasn't just training for us, but it was also training for our support folks, for the folks in the control center for the astronauts that would be inside during the spacewalk for the, for the whole team. And so the training team was training, not only us, but the support team. And you try to think of everything that could go wrong when you're going to go on a mission and do it or do it and do spacewalks and so on. So you try to imagine everything can go wrong and you have a plan for that. Then you're going to encounter problems while you're working and training. Oh man, I never thought that would happen. And so then you come up with solutions for that. But there's always like, I think there's like a list somewhere in the cosmos of things that can go wrong every day <laughs> for us, right? <laughs> and we, we try to be prepared for those things. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm prepared for this, this, and this. But every once in a while, there's something that we're not prepared for that throws us a curveball at work or in our lives. And uh, I think what we need to do is, what we did at NASA was rely on the problem solving and the teamwork we did for the training we did to solve the problems we knew about or encountered in the heat of the moment, you kind of you you kind of spring into action when it's a new problem. So I I had things happen to me uh, on my the the what's I don't know if the worst is the right word, but the most um, the most significant mistake I made, and probably the worst mistake. But it was they they came up with a solution was when I, I stripped the bolt while fixing the, the telescope. Ooh. and it was a it, it was a very complicated repair. It was on the last mission. It was my last spacewalk most complicated spacewalk we've ever attempted. We were taking apart an instrument, um, space telescope imaging spectrograph, which was was working for many for a few years and was able to do things like analyze the the stars, um, the the atmospheres of far off planets. 
And so they could search for life on other places with this instrument. The, the astronomers love this. The scientists love this instrument, but it had a power supply failure and they couldn't turn it on anymore. And what we had done up to that point in all the missions, we would just take out a piece of equipment and put a new piece of equipment in. And, uh, and that's the way we did it. We never tried to take anything apart because these things were, were sealed up and buttoned up mm -hmm. to withstand space launch and to be in, to be in space for a long time. So imagine if you were building something like that, you'd make sure it was really put together well and no sure. one's going to ever mess with it, right? So that's what they did. And so this, this power supply that had failed was hidden behind an access panel which had, which had 111 small screws with washers and glue on the stakings. We had to overcome all these things and get that power supply out and put it. This is the first time we ever tried anything like this. A hundred new tools were invented for this thing and it falls on my day. And the easiest thing I'm going to do is remove a handrail, which had four big screws, at two at the top and two on the bottom. It, required, it didn't require any new tools. It was my old power tool. To, it, one line in a checklist, 30 seconds, and I go and strip one of the four oh. bolts on the bottom. So it's not coming off. And I realize that handle's not coming off. All those 111 small screws aren't coming out. Power supply is not going to be replaced. The instrument's not coming back to life. We'll never find out if there's life. <laughs> never find out if there's life in the universe, and everyone will blame me forever. Right? Where's so, your blood pressure right that's now? That's exactly. I was, just, yeah. I was just like, holy crap! But uh, you know, I, I fessed up, and and uh, the team got sprang into action and came up with a solution, which was actually very simple, just to tear the thing off. <laughs> so <laughs> that's I how I would have done it. Off. That's exactly. <laughs> right. I'm genius. That's right. I was thinking of like all these complicated things, but luckily we had a guy in the back room who was saying, "What would I do in my garage?" It was loose at the top. He said, that was I just, Tony. I was just telling that thing all right. Hey, exactly. Tony. Tony. Tony in the back room would do yeah. it. So it was, his name was Jim Corbo. But anyway, uh, his idea was just tear the thing off. And it, it was a Sunday, so most people are not working on Sunday, but it, the whole team was in different places of the country. Calls up to the Goddard Space Flight Center from Houston. They get a, a instrument out of the clean room. And they pull on this handrail with a fish scale, right? We're, I, we don't have very much time to figure this out because I'm wow. floating up there and with limited life support. The thing tears off. They break this bolt at 60 pounds of force. So they were measuring to see how, how hard you'd have how to How hard pull. I got to pull that thing to yeah. break it, to break yeah. that bolt at the bottom. So it was 60 pounds of force at the top, and that was no problem. We, you know, we were, I, was, I knew I could do that. So once that solution came in, I knew we could do that. We had to tape the bottom of the handrail so shrapnel wouldn't go flying. But... uh but the guys in the gym were pretty excited about that. They, <laughs> they thought it was like the greatest. They had a picture really? on the gym. You see, you know, you had to be strong enough to pull this handrail off it up. So yeah, we busted it with, with brute force. <laughs> so that worked out. That that worked out uh, because it, it wasn't my idea. The, the team came up with that idea. So you it, problems arise, but you have a team there to help you. Any any possibility that the aliens intentionally sabotaged that? <laughs> no, I don't think. I don't think it was the aliens. Uh, nah, I, I, I'm trying to think of like a funny thing to respond to on that. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think what's, that had anything to do with that. What's one. the fear with the shrapnel? Explain that because I know you're in space. There's no gravity, and yeah. uh, you know I've I've read articles about oh so you can have a you know piece of dirt flying yeah. through space. It could go yeah. so fast it could literally <clears throat> yeah, space destroy a machine. A real thing, oh yeah, right? no space debris is a problem. In fact, uh, the the my mission at se that that my second mission, my first mission was on space shuttle Columbia. And that was to Hubble and Columbia. The next mission for Columbia, which was in 03, my mission was in 02. So 10 months later or so, Columbia went on its next mission and it didn't come back. We had that accident in 03. Mm. And so it was because the debris came off of the external tank, which was the, the fuel tank for the shuttle and hit a, the wing of the shuttle while it was taken off and put a hole in the wing. Mm. Crew didn't realize that. And no one realized that that happened. They knew the debris strike happened. But the, the investigation after the accident discovered that that there was a hole in the wing that they didn't know about when they tried to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. A lot of heat uh, is generated and took took the wing off. So debris was a problem in that regard, but also now that we, when we started looking at that problem, well, we can't have debris coming off the tank. We're like, well, you could also hit debris in space as well. And there's a lot of stuff up there. There's a lot of debris, some and more and more man-made debris, but also natural rocks and asteroids, micrometeorites and stuff like that. And at the higher orbit where we were at, at Hubble, there's actually more stuff up there. So the higher the orbits are, there's more stuff up there because it's at a higher energy and it stays around longer. And it eventually will be pulled in and will enter the atmosphere. But Burn up or whatever. There's more. So, so we were at a pretty high risk. They actually canceled the mission because we didn't have a safe haven up there as well for um, if we did get a debris strike. Whereas on space station, if you sent a, a shuttle up to the space station and it couldn't come home 
because it took damage. You could stay on the space station for a while. Not mm. a big deal necessarily. You'll figure out a way to get you home. But at Hubble, there's no life support. So if we had a debris strike and we weren't able to repair it, we'd be stuck. And so they didn't like that idea. They canceled the mission, but we was able to get back on the books after about a year and a half or so. We came up with a plan to have a rescue flight. So if we got stuck, we were going to have a rescue crew that was ready to launch and we were going to exchange crew from one spaceship to the other. But that's how much of a problem the, when we talked about the space debris problem, we were concerned about that hitting something going, we're going 17,500 miles an hour. Yeah. I was going to say, so why is it so, so dangerous? Because it's going so fast. Because you're going so fast. Even with the shuttle accident we had, it was a piece of foam that had no weight to it. We really wow, had no a piece weight. Of foam? A piece of foam. So the, the space shuttle uh, external tank is like a big thermos bottle. The the fuel inside of it is cryogenic, so it's like minus you know, 200, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really cold, right? So so this thermos bottle keeps this, the the foam is acts like a thermos bottle. It's a huge tank that we have for the space shuttle to keep that fuel cold. And the foam didn't always ad adhere to the metal, especially certain parts of the tank really well. And so pieces of it would, would fly off. But we never thought it could be of consequence because it had no weight. I mean, it absolutely had no weight. It was wow. so, so light. And but a piece of foam came off at the wrong time, and because the it, because it was so light, it actually slowed down in the atmosphere. You know, like it kind of almost like floated for a mm -hmm. little bit. It kind of slowed down, and the shuttle was accelerating. So the relative velocity when the shuttle hit that thing was like 850 miles an hour. So you hit something going 850 miles an hour, you're going to know about it. And it was the upper, the leading edge of the wing was built to to take temperature, but not debris. Not impact. So not impact. So that's yeah. what that's what happened there. So, so let's let's talk. Let's back up a little yeah, bit and talk because yeah. astronauts. I mean, I got, when I was younger, I was I was fascinating because fascinated because uh, to become an astronaut, you have to be mm. a super athlete. Yeah. You have to be a super scientist. You have to have. I mean, it's basically like you are picking from such a small group of people. I know I'm giving you all kinds of compliments. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. I'm not gonna, keep going. I want to, I wanna, what, yeah. what was the, the one percenters, yeah. what's the process like of getting selected and like, how, how does that work? What's that like? The, uh, it's the hardest thing about being an astronaut is getting selected because you have thousands of people that want to do that job and they're only going to be able to pick a handful, right? Mm -hmm. in, my, in my, my astronaut class was the largest one they've ever had tied for another class that 35 Americans were picked. But typically, they're picking more like 20 or 12 or 15. It's a, it's a small number. But you know, thousands of applications are coming in. Now, we're upwards of like 15,000 applications come in for those few spots. So and by the way, you don't even apply unless you have all these well, credentials, no, you can, right? And you can apply, but you won't. Be, so the first level, the first step is to see if you're qualified. So there are things that people, if they're interested, you can look on the NASA website. This is for the NASA program. So Justin not, or not, I can apply? You guys can apply, the, but you anyone yes. can apply. Yeah. But the, the to meet the minimum qualifications, and they've changed this a little bit. Uh, but it's a it's a qualifying degree, so a bachelor's degree in science or math or engineering or, and then typically for civilians, um, you also have uh, at least a master's degree. Quite often, a doctor's degree as well, either a medical degree or a PhD in engineering or science or something like that, or some really impressive work experience. So uh, the other the other route is the military route, and so these are high performing people from the military. They, they will get nominated by their branch of the military. At least they used to. I think they're still doing it that way. So the military will provide names to NASA to consider. But civilians, just any civilian can send in an application. But if you don't meet those minimum qualifications, you'll be eliminated pretty quickly. But out of those, let's say, I don't know, 15,000 or so, about 90% of the people that apply will be qualified. They'll meet those minimum qualifications. And then we start reviewing all those applications. And... Once you get selected, you start becoming part of the selection process. And uh, we always had three people look at every application, two astronauts and one adult. There's a way we would do it. So, yeah, like, uh, we would do, so some of these things, you know, not, not to give away personal information on applicants, but sometimes you'd see some guy and you're like, we should get this guy in here just for the kicks. Like, uh, <laughs> one guy was a Net-A-Sketch champion. Shut like, up. Let's get this guy in here, you know, and let's see what he can do in a net just sketch you know, and they're like, yeah. no, you know, is there any other reason, Mike, why you'd want him in there? Go, no, but that just sketch is pretty cool, you know. <laughs> like, no, it was like stuff like that. You'd say, like, no. So you always need like one adult, like a manager or someone like that. It's like, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So anyway, we would go through there. And so you're looking through these things, all these applications. So we had, say, we each, each one of uh, these little teams of three were given maybe 600 applications to look at. 
and you, you come up with the top 10% together, right? This is our top 60. And then you go out and get references on those guys. So the things I would, I would look for was you start, you just start seeing what you think is important to you for the job. And one thing is, is, is the person qualified? Does it, you know, do they have the right background and show that they could be trainable to, to do the job? Um, that's, that's one thing. Then uh, you try to look for other things that maybe aren't as obvious. Like one for me was, uh, is, is this, is this person like a me person or is this person a team player? Mm. Right. And sometimes you'd get these applications, which were just extraordinary what these people had accomplished, but it was like, it didn't, there wasn't any indication that they were able to act as part of a team or or any, another another thing to look at for me was passion for the job for because the, the job was a job you know it wasn't all fun and games and and oh, yeah. you know media appearances and you know it was it it was a job you know you were working late nights and in the simulator a lot and doing support roles for people and not getting any credit for it but you but you needed to enjoy doing that you needed to take pride in helping other people uh, achieve for the program and, and and the program was what was most important. So that that became a little different. Most of the people seemed like, all right, yeah, they can handle the job. They're qualified to do it. But what was what really I thought became more important was, is this a person that you would you would trust? It was almost like picking a family member. This is a person I would trust with my life, with my with my family's life, with my kids' life. You know, that that's who is this person? And we found people like that. I mean, that's that was the best thing about being a part of the the astronaut office was that. That's the kind of people we, we typically had. I, I felt that they I, were the, I imagine the that best would, people I, I've ever been around. I imagine that actually would be the hardest. Like you, the, just the qualifications and education. I would think that would uh, create a lot of god complex, a lot of ego maniacs, mm -hmm. and so it's probably the most challenging part would probably be finding a a good team player. Yeah, that's that's hard to do. Someone you would really trust. You know, so it's almost like if if I make a mistake, and and I write about this in the book a little bit about like when you make a mistake, do you get thrown under the bus? And we see like in sports teams, you yeah. know, some guy makes a mistake at the end of the game. Well, what happened to the, the rest of the game? Where was everybody else that made that that play at the end so, so critical? Yeah. Right? That they, you know, do you throw the guy under the bus or do you stick with him? And I've seen you see examples of, of both, right? That they they stick with the, the the teammate and they say, no, it was you know, can't blame him. He helped get us there. This is what happened. Him or her, or whatever you know. Um, but uh, or do you throw? Or do you point the finger and and say, yeah, that that play blew it for us. That's not the kind of person I think you want to be around. You want to be around someone when you make the mistake, they're going to stick with you. And, and when they make the mistake, you're going to stick with them and you're going to fail or succeed as a team. And that I think is a rare thing to find. Yeah. We like to think that it's common, but I don't always, I don't know if it is. And so, but that I think was for me the most important thing because it was a team game. There was nothing that was that difficult to do individually. There's no one task that just about anyone couldn't do. I, I think really if with enough training, all of us can do those things. I think whatever, whatever it was, we might be better at certain things than others, depending on our skill set and background, but it was just so much of it that you couldn't, and not everybody could, could do everything, not anyone. Could do so it was very important to be able to, to work together and keep the mission in mind. And that was more important than any individual accomplishment. Did you have a favorite teammate? Uh, I really like all the folks I, I flew with on my second flight. Yeah. I would say that's my, that was, that that team on my second flight, uh, they were they were all my. I probably couldn't pick out one of them. But what was it about them? What was it about them? Yeah, that they had my back no matter what, and they yeah. still do. They're the people I'm closest to in my life. Uh, I would say other than my family, than my wife and and kids, it was like a hybrid of um, family and friendship. Maybe like what you guys have here. It seems mm -hmm. to me where you really uh, rely mm -hmm. on each other when when needed. You have each other's back. Um, I would not hesitate to tell them anything i knew they would never wouldn't hold it against me and i would do the same for them and and just just be there for each other and we still are there for each other it's it's to me it's somewhat remarkable what's that we what, can we can we still can can support each other no matter what's going on what, what's the testing like at that point so you make it past you, know, you get you know selected and then mm -hmm. you got to test right they have to test you to see yeah. if you can handle pressure or the the you know the the, the flight or what, what does that yeah. look like uh so the, one, the 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 biggest hurdle is getting picked right and then there's interview process and medical evaluation and all that stuff that go into it background checks 
and all that stuff that that take place too. But that's still all that process is the toughest thing to get through because they're so competitive. But once you arrive, once you get in, it it somewhat changes a bit because they want you to be successful, right? So once they pick you, once you're selected, uh, they will do everything they can to have you be successful in the training. Which means if you're having some difficult with some with something, you'll you'll get you'll get help. Um, also, the mindset of our of our office once you get in there was to help each other. So I was not a very strong swimmer, right? When I was a, I never grew up liking the water very much. I kind of stayed out of it. You know, I don't know. To me, like you know, we talked about our Sicilian heritage. You know, we stayed out of the water. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't. You walk in, in the York. water. Yeah. It's right you walk, here. If you want to go somewhere, you go over the bridge. You know, and you have a tunnel, you have a bridge, you have boats, you know. It's there. And my but, mother was yeah. like, you know, what do you got to swim for? You know, even, you know, Jesus walked on the water. You know, he, he said, Peter walked. He didn't say, jump in the water and swim toward me. You know what I mean? There was no, you know, we don't. So I just, I didn't like it. And I was skinny and it was cold in New York. It was freezing in the ocean. I, I never really learned to swim. And then. I get this letter after we get picked, right? I, you know, we get a phone call and they tell you, oh, we want you to become, you know, you're still interested. I'm like, yes, of course, you know, and you get, that's all great. And then they send you a packet of info. And then the packet of info, or the, 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 you know, the intro letter is like, congratulations, I'm all excited. And like the next paragraph says, please practice your swimming because you're going to have to pass a, a swim test to go through water survival training with the Navy. Right, <laughs> I'm like what? In the heck? What it is is that if you bailed out of the space shuttle, or in our we fly high performance jets, these T-38s, if you parachute out, if you eject out of one of those things, and you land in the ocean, yeah. they got to come get you. But you got to stay alive until they can come find you. So you have to pass this water survival course that the Navy provides in Pensacola. And in order to do that, you have to pass a swim test. And they, they, they the reason they warn you for that is because other candidates have shown up. And then they can't swim, and then Navy sends them back and like teach these people to swim first. They we can't; they'll drown. So you have to pass the swim test. I'm like, oh my goodness, because this thing, I, the thing I've been avoiding my whole life, I you know I, now is going to have to perform. They never asked during the interview. Luckily, I was also glad about that. I think they just assumed like that if you were able to do things like you know like a, a swim should be in the same category as like making a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> just about everybody should be able to do it. But so luckily they never asked me about that or else I'd have to say no, but they didn't ask and and but they said, you know, you're going to have to practice. So I practiced and practiced and but I still wasn't feeling great about it cuz you say, you know, my impression was I'm going to be in it with all these great athletes and these super achievers and here I'm going to come this, you know, this egghead that you know can't swim and you know they're going to make fun of me and it's going to be a bad a bad experience. Our first week as a group in my astronaut class was mainly administrative stuff and introductory things. And our training was going to start week two. So the Friday of that first week, uh, we're about, we're done with the day. We're in this classroom together and a guy named Jeff Ashby, who's a Navy pilot who had in the class before us was a great leader. was a good, done really well. And he was in charge of helping us in our training, leading us through it. So he comes in, he goes, all right, you know, first, first week is over now. Uh, you know, before you go home for the weekend, I want to remind everyone that we start our training in earnest on Monday and our first event is the swim test, right? <laughs> so I'm saying like, really, uh, can we get a math quiz or a, <laughs> you know, a physics test? Could we do something else? It really is going to be the swim test. And then he goes on to say, uh, who are the strong swimmers in this group? And we had a couple Navy qualified swimmers and some other people raise, if can folks raise their hand, admitting that they were strong swimmers. And then he goes, more important, uh, who are the weak swimmers? And don't lie to me. I need the truth. So I'm like, uh, you know, I raised my hand. And a few others, including Charlie Camarda from Ozone Park, Queens, another Italian kid okay. who never learned how to <laughs> swim, raises his hand. And uh, he says, all right, everyone who didn't raise their hand can go home. But uh, everyone who raised their hand stay after class. The strong swimmers and the weak swimmers arrange a time to meet at a pool over the weekend. The strong swimmers are helping are going to help the weak swimmers with their swimming. Oh, that's great. Because when we go to the pool Smart. on Monday, no one leaves the pool until everyone passes that test. And so that to me was an introduction to where I was now. It wasn't I'm better at this than you are. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to shine and you're not. Your success was how the team did. You could be Michael Phelps and set a, a world record in that pool, but if one of your teammates got left behind, you failed. And I didn't also did the, now the, the motivation for me was I didn't want to hold everybody else. Back. Right. Right. Yeah. So we got together over the weekend and helped, you know, I got help 
and we went. Everyone went to the pool. What, and, and what a smart passed. way to train you guys yeah. to be a Did, team. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. Very so that, that brings me to another yeah. interesting question related to your training. Were there leaders or people that trained you that that stood out to you that were just phenomenal? Like that, just that right there seems to me like such a brilliant strategy to yeah. bring you guys all together. Did you meet anybody during this process that you you admire as their, their leadership and their ability to train you guys? Yeah, and I think you know the there's he was Jeff was an was an astronaut and uh, there were others like that. I mean, my commander Scott Altman, uh, the, the leaders of the astronaut office, guys like Kent Rominger, Charlie Precourt, a lot of the military guys. I would say maybe more than others. I think the, what was cool about the astronaut office is that in the leadership and the culture of taking care of each other came out of the best things that you might see in the military, I think, mm. where you're really in this together mm -hmm. and taking care of each other. And uh, that was that was the culture. And that was the, the leadership was different. Pers I think everyone has their own personal style based on their personalities and how they feel comfortable. But the idea of caring for each other was most important. It was a, a moonwalker uh, named Alan Bean. Only 12 guys walked I was going to say Michael Jackson, but not Mike, not Michael Jackson. <laughs> only 12 guys. Well, he was a moonwalker too, but, you know, but, uh, but one of the guys that really did walk on the moon, going back to your first question, yeah. right? So <laughs> yeah. he was the fourth guy out of the 12 and, uh, Alan, uh, told, he came and spoke to my astronaut class and he told us that the most important thing to be a good leader is to find a way to care for and admire everyone on your team. Yeah. You they have to know that you care about them and you admire what they can do. And if you find someone that you think you just, you can't find anything you like about it, don't think of it as you don't like them. Think of it as, think of it as you don't know them well enough. Mm -hmm. and keep digging until you find mm -hmm. something. And that was the key to being a, a good leader. And I still I still believe that. that was like the best lesson I learned. So I think I picked up little things um, from people, different leadership styles. But certainly I think that's the one thing that I think all good leaders have uh, in in common is that I felt like, and were, you know, some guys were rough, you know, to kind of be on you all the time maybe, but I knew that they cared. Sometimes those are the guys that cared about you the most, mm. that they would be there for you and make sure that that you were you were taken care of. So I, I think also, though, when you talked about the instructors teaching us, so there was, you know, there's the astronauts, but there are thousands of people who supported us. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the instructors were really quite, uh, were quite unique, I thought, in their, in their perspective on things because – they weren't going to get to fly in space. You know, a lot of them wanted to, uh, maybe, but they just didn't have that opportunity. Every once in a while, an instructor would get picked to be an astronaut. But what they what they all had in common was that our success was more important to them than anything they had that than their own success. Mm. And it it it's there were certain things that happened uh, to me that made me realize that right before launch. We were in quarantine and our instructors, our spacewalk instructors came to visit to go over some things with us before we were going to leave to the Kennedy Space Center. So we were still in Houston, but we had a quarantine uh, situation there, <clears throat> a building we would go to crew quarters where we would live and eat and it was all clean and they, you had to be checked by the doctor before. It was like COVID before there was COVID, yeah. you know. Because God forbid somebody's sick up. Uh, God forbid, yeah, you uh, don't uh, want to yeah. get a head cold in orbit. So they, you, you want to be germ-free going to space. Right. So so they put you in quarantine for a, for about a week and a half. Anyways, but they, they were cleared by the docs to come work with us and go over some things. And Christy Hansen, Tomas Gonzalez-Torres. And I remember as we were saying goodbye to them, Christy was looking at us, like just kind of going over the last few things. And we just looked at her and she looked at me and she, she, I could tell she was emotional and she's just, I just want you guys to be okay and to do well. You could tell it meant so much to her that our success was so important. You know, we're sitting here in a gym here, right? So it's kind of like a good trainer, right? Mm -hmm. Is a person that is, you know, their, your health is there is more important to them than anything, right? It's, yeah. a, mm -hmm. and that's, I think is when you can find a, a trainer like that, or you can find an instructor like that, or a mentor, a teacher like that, that really feels that your, your success is the most important thing in their life. That's a special person. Not many people can do that. And that's why I, I think we had at NASA, that's why we were successful was because not just our astronauts took care of each, uh, each other, but also we had Even the people like that. Yeah. Those instructors were, were there to, to make us successful. And uh, it was it was that really, now as you're talking about it, thinking of all the people, that water survival course we went through in the Navy, mm -hmm. you know, these chief petty officers that were helping us, drill sergeants and stuff. They couldn't be mean to us like they would to... The regular uh, army or the you know the regular recruits and so on, but they're very nice to us. But but they really wanted us to be safe in our airplanes and our flying, and and they 
you know, they were they really were passionate about what they were doing. And when you can find a passionate instructor, that's a that's a good thing. I wanted to bring something up that you mm -hmm. said off air that I mm -hmm. thought was pretty crazy. Um, alongside, I didn't know that you know you you didn't really prefer swimming and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, alongside that you had a fear of heights yeah i don't like heights i thought you were joking when like, you said that no You're no how them. is this possible yeah. yeah well a couple things there I, I so i don't like them i really when i was a little kid i wanted to grow up to be like neil armstrong when i saw him land on a moon and then uh i went like to this mountain it wasn't a really tall mountain but it was a mountain that we had in new york it was called high point or my, my father grew up near there and so we went up there and <laughs> it had these these views and I didn't like them. I didn't just like, I didn't like being up that high. I don't like, I still don't like looking over the edge of a building or a bridge. I just don't like it. You know, I, I just don't like it. Uh, but what I, what I found out later in life, what I really don't like is I don't like gravity. <laughs> my friend Reed Weisman, my you friend can do Reed all that without suggests, gravity yeah. okay because you know you're up there and you're like 350 miles above the planet i'm like oh, okay you know i'm not going anywhere I'm a, it's the gravity that's the problem so that's my mike i gotta I credit see. that to my friend reed wiseman who actually pointed that out to me i was talking to him about that he doesn't like heights either and he was saying oh, really what we don't like is gravity that's true that's but that funny. fear of falling is what it is yeah. right because you will get killed jumping off of things right so so i think that's that's really what it was but i don't like these things my wife uh a few years ago uh, for her 50th birthday, uh, she wanted to jump out of an airplane. It was like one of these life goals that she had. So she goes, I'm going to jump, I want to jump out of an airplane on my 50th birthday. I go, oh, that's a great idea. And then she says, it wouldn't be great if we would do it together. I'm like, boy, that would be great, but that's not happening. I am not. <laughs> Unless the airplane idea. is on yeah. fire. Yeah. Like I can understand if the airplane is on fire and you have a good working parachute and you're pretty sure that things aren't going to end well if you stay inside, then I'd maybe give it a try. Yeah. But other than that, I'm not getting out of the airplane's working. I'm not getting out. <laughs> so yeah, I just don't, I don't, I'm not a thrill seeker. What's, what's it like being on a, uh being strapped to a rocket and go, getting out of the atmosphere. I mean, it's so much yeah. power. How many G-forces is that? I mean, I had a little <coughs> tiny experience mm -hmm. on an F-16. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So I, How'd pulled, you like that? Oh, my God. It was it was insane. It was it was like, I, it's hard to describe, actually. Yeah. Uh, but it was like 9.3 Gs. And so, Whoa, that's a lot of G. Okay. Yeah, you could pass out what? with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He yeah. threw up afterwards. He's, He's failing, failing to tell that part. And it's hard to get him to throw Way up. later. I always <laughs> made it the whole time without throwing up. That's he the said to me, when it. he came back, I said, what was it like? And he goes, it feels like every atom in my body got pulled apart. <laughs> I said, okay. Really? Yeah. okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it was like basically somebody crushing me. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what it felt like. That's yeah. a lot of, G but the throw up thing, we had a Navy SEAL in our office, Chris Cassidy, who's his standing challenge to our our uh, trainers, our, our gym uh, gym instructors, was anyone that could make them throw up got a case of beer. <laughs> and no one could do it. They would, you know, they would run wow. him ragged, make him do it. He couldn't do it to this guy. Wow. So, yeah. But so what's that, what's that like? Taking yeah, off so the, and, so the chief, the airplane, you, what you do, you go, that's a lot of G to take, right? We could go up to like five or six Gs in our airplanes, but you only can do that for a short amount of time, mm. you know, a second or so. Uh, you've got a technique is to try to force the blood back because the blood come out of your head. Yeah. And especially if you're, when you're sitting in a, in a jet and you, you go into a bank turn like that, you're still sort of, and you're turning, but still the, 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 the gravity force can still take the blood out of your head and you pass out and that's bad. You can get killed flying an airplane with a, a G induced lack, lack of consciousness. Right. So that's, you gotta, that you gotta be careful with that in the airplane, of course, in a high performance jet. And it's uncomfortable. Usually when you get one, you got one airplane ride, yeah, one. See if we get another one. Because it gets a lot better. Your second I one. I figured your first as one, much. Your yeah. first one's so well overwhelmed. You really want us to, but no you don't want to ask for a expect. second one. But you say, how about another one? Because you'll feel a lot better. Your body will, will be, a, your brain really is getting trained. So, yeah. so you feel better. But on, in a space flight, we, get, we go up to three Gs on a launch, but it's sustained for two and a half minutes. And it's at the end. The G forces build up gradually. The max is three on your body, but you're on your back. Okay. Mm. So now instead of it going through your head, like when you're in a chair and the blood's going to come out of your head, what chest. it is, is getting you right in the chest. So, oh. you, so whatever your body weight is, multiply it by three. And that's what you got in the chest. Mm -hmm. So I felt like there were three big dudes sitting on me. That's what I felt like. And like, all right, enough is enough. Yeah. And that lasts for two and a half minutes. Um, with the shuttle, the beginning of the long, you know, you're going quickly. You, you know, it, cause we, the main engines would start up first and, uh, they were liquid fueled. And uh, you can shut a liquid fueled engine off, just like a car or a lawnmower. Mm. Cut the Something fuel, happens, it's going to stop. Right, we're going to stop. Right, and they did that twice. They had two uh, aborts on the pad after the main engine start. They shut them down and go anywhere or try another day. But you have six seconds to make up your mind. 
because after that, the solid rocket boosters on the shuttle would light. Those are the two big white rockets. That and you we can't had. turn that off when it's No, it like sticks of dynamite. So once you light them, you cannot turn them off and you're going. As soon as they as soon as they light you you move hundred miles an hour God, before you clear the off. tower wow. and you accelerate from zero to seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour <sighs> in eight and a half minutes. And the, the G forces at the end, you know, there's is that those three G's, the solid rockets really run rough. So they shake you up. There's a lot of violence. My first, and they can't really recreate that. You can recreate G-forces mm -hmm. um, like in, a, in, a, in a centrifuge. So they, right. we went through that in a centrifuge. You can recreate that. But the violence and the shaking, you really, <laughs> you really can't do that. And the first time, you know, they try to warn you, oh, it's going to be pretty rocky. But the first time I was like, uh, and I had like two veterans on either side of me and they're like high-fiving each other over my head. Like, this guy's knock it off. <laughs> and then like after that, they were kind of like, you weren't scared. Were you, Mike? And I was like, no, not me. Of course not. So I wanted to fly a second time so I could sit next to a rookie and make fun of him. And that's what, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, oh, you're not scared. But so it was a lot of rocking. And then the two and a half, first two and a half minutes, those, after that, those solid rockets leave. And then it, the, it smooths out. So a, a liquid rocket will ride a lot smoother uh, than than the solid ones. So, like for example, the SpaceX vehicle is a totally liquid fueled rocket, no no solids on it, so it won't shake as much. Mm -hmm. The one they're going to send to the moon, the Space Launch System, that has got solids on it, so they can they're going to they're going to shake a bit on the way up. Anyway, the once that eight and a half minutes is over, then the main engines cut, and then it gets really peaceful, mm -hmm. and it's almost like eerily peaceful like uh because everything just stops and all the all the noise all the shaking all the violence everything's done do you feel immediate like loss of gravity absolutely yeah, yeah. so you're just oh. like you feel like it, it cuts and then you feel yourself just kind of float up you still you're still in your harness but your arms just float up like this wow by themselves you know our arms stay down like this because of gravity so they'll just float up like this i had a pen on a on a lanyard that floated up next to me and then you're, you're strapped in still so you're not going to go anywhere, but you have to start getting ready. First thing you do is take off your helmet. And I remember seeing Tom Hanks do this in Apollo 13 before I was an astronaut. I was like, I want to do that someday. So I just took off my helmet and put it right in front of me and let go and watched it float there in front of me. <laughs> so you That's just so said something. Trippy. I had a question for you. I'm glad you went that way. Uh, when you watch any space movies, mm -hmm. who did the best job and who who shit the bed? Like, what's what are the ones that are probably the yeah. most accurate that you enjoy and the other ones that you're going, oh, that's not yeah. Well, Adam, let me first say I really, you know, I don't really care the accuracy of the space movie. Uh, if it involves astronauts, doesn't really matter to me that much as long as the astronaut looks cool. <laughs> you, know, like, you guys, you guys said something here. And I let you go on for a little bit. Our astronauts are all like, you know, superhuman, great athletes, and I'm thinking, <laughs> okay, but uh, but that's what you think. Maybe if when they portrayed that way in the movies, you yeah. know, they're all these like really fit, smart, great people. Like that's good. So as long as the astronaut is cool, I'm happy with it. So so like you know George Clooney Bruce Willis, was, was yeah. cool. You yeah. know uh, yeah Bruce Willis. So he was yeah. You know those guys were cool. Uh, Brad Pitt was uh, yeah. Ryan Gosling played Neil Armstrong. You know uh, so those guys were all cool. Matt Damon. I, I don't know if I mentioned him, but you know these guys. You know people think like Matt Damon in The Martian. He got impaled by an antenna. Right, an antenna went inside him. I don't know if you remember the movie. Yeah, yeah. And he pulls it out and he sews himself up. People think I can do that. You know, <laughs> I saw that movie like the next day. I was getting something to eat in Whole Foods, and they gave me like a plastic container for a salad, and I got a, a cut on it. I'm like running around. I'm, you know, my fingers bleeding. You have a little bit. You have a band aid and running around. You know, I'm thinking. People, but people think because Matt Damon can pull an antenna out of his stomach and sew it up that I can do that too. Meanwhile, a paper cut <laughs> freaks me out. So. Uh, as long as the astronaut looks cool, I'm happy. Matthew McConaughey, not Interstellar, yeah. he was a little shaky. Yeah. I didn't like that very much. You know, so I like you know whether or not it's uh, and that was a little complicated too. But he was always worried. I'm like this is not good. You got to be cool. The astronaut's got to be <laughs> what about like the, cool. What about the yeah. physics? Like because I know you got to oh, be a math physics. I heard answer to your question. Yeah, I heard yeah. Interstellar was pretty good with the but, physics. Right. I, I, that was he was in a library and we. I saw that movie three times. I got invited to three screens. I'm still not sure what's going on in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was a futuristic thing, and we can't grow corn anymore. I don't know what was going on in that movie. I can't. I, I maybe you can explain it to me. No. <laughs> but there was a lot of theories of going through different wormholes or this yeah, other stuff. Yeah. So that you know, that's all like, whatever theory or make believe stuff. But uh, maybe a little bit over my head. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> the uh, the one that's most um, uh, truthful or accurate 
was the Apollo 13 movie. Okay. Because I, I it, what it showed was, it, well, it's based on fact. It was a, an actual thing that right. happened. But it also showed uh, the camaraderie with the crew and with the ground. And we were talking earlier about how the people in the space program wanted you to be successful. Uh, and that really portrayed it um, of how much they cared about the crew's lives, getting them back, you know, failure's not an option, or bringing that crew back alive. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that that was the the feeling, the sense of purpose that we had in the control center. And that that depicted that really well. Um, we had, uh, I was giving a tour, um, Joe Torrey and the Dodgers, who was managing the Dodgers at the time, were in town for a, for to play the Astros, and he he brought he's a big uh, supporter of the space program, and he brought some of the players and coaches and came in for a tour. And Gene Kranz, who's that guy without failure is not an option, mm -hmm. helped with the tour. Told him about Apollo, and we had a new flight director, this guy named uh, Mike Serafin, who's now the the uh, program manager for the space launch system, going to the moon. But back then he was a flight director, and he was on console as a propulsion guy. When we when they lost uh, the um, the Columbia, and he was talking about that, and he was saying how he wasn't sure if he wanted to continue in his job when that happened. He's telling the group this, and I was saying, you know, I, he wasn't at risk. You know, he wasn't at risk to to have anything happen to him because he was in a control center. But he was as phys as visibly upset about that and emotionally upset about it as anybody else, as any other family member or crew member or friend. And that's that's what it meant to them that the lives of those folks that they lost was so were, were, was crushing to all those folks in that room when that happened, and so they were they were all about bringing the crew back and supporting the mission. So that's what I one of the things I liked about Apollo thirteen is it it showed that. Mm. So I thought that was a great one. Um, the right stuff is my all time greatest movie. Have you guys ever seen that one? Oh, which oh, ones I have? That's it. a little before ten. That changed my life. That one. So that's my all time favorite movie. I don't know if it's the most accurate one, but it's a, it's based on a book by Tom Wolfe and um, came out in 1983, okay. 83, 84. Came like at the end, like December of 83. And I remember this because <laughs> I went to see it. I was a senior in college and I had given up because I was afraid of heights and I was kind of scared of a lot of stuff. I was like, I'd never become an astronaut. And I kind of gave up the whole space. Trip. And then how do you become an astronaut? It's impossible. So I kind of crossed it off the list when I was about eight years old. But I went to see that movie when I was a senior in college and uh, it brought back my, those feelings, those dreams I had as a little kid. They never left me. I just thought I could never do it. So this has been like a lifelong thing for you. It was a lifelong thing, but I never thought I could, I could do it, Adam. I thought it was, you know, impossible, right? For some of the reasons that we've stated in this conversation. But when I saw that movie, I realized how important it was to me. And maybe I couldn't become an astronaut, but at least I could try to help others go because I really want to be a part of the space program. That movie is about the original seven astronauts and the test pilots that, that came before I have now. seen that movie. Doug just brought that up. Yeah. I did see that a long time ago. Did they remake yeah. it? I feel like they remade it. They made, you know what? They, I think they, they made another one. You know what? They made a TV I I show out of it. Is that what it was? I think that's Matt what Gio it was. TV, there was a, a there was like a seven part yeah. series yep. they did uh, on like HBO or something. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I have seen that. It was Matt Geo that did it. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Called the right stuff. Yeah. They made, and they were concentrating at that time going back to the test pilot days, like Chuck Hager breaking the sound barrier. It was actually really good. It was really good. You know, Mike, you brought up a couple times some of the, the, like the potential risks and some of the travesty. I, I remember as a kid, I was yeah. really young. I was in, in, in class and they put up, they, they brought the, they oh wheeled in the TV to have all the kids watch the challenger. Yeah. yeah. Cause there was a teacher on there. Right. I remember the big deal. Yep. And I was too, I was really young. I was too young to really understand the, yeah. the impact of that. But I remember the teachers uh, crying. I couldn't figure out. And of course, yeah. as you get older, the fear of, because, I mean, you know, we, we there's no perfect record. Yeah. Um, and with with space flight, the fail is is death usually, right? Yeah. yeah. It's how usually do you good or bad. Yeah. How yeah. do you deal with the, the like, the fear or how do they train you with it? Because you're going up and you know, like, okay, this is one of the more risky things that yeah. that, that people do. I, I think for when, when that happened, uh, that was in 1986. That was mm -hmm. January of 1986. And I was, uh, I had graduated college in 84. And I, I was going to grad school in 86 to pursue this dream. Mm. But I was still where I was working in, a, in New York City for IBM at the time. And uh, it was a work day when that happened. And uh, and I was like, we're on noon. Like, we're in school. You guys yeah. were in school, like, late late morning, mm -hmm. something like this. And so the news came over, you know, and we were in the, I don't know if we had much internet. We didn't have the internet at all back then. But it was on, like, you know, the in the lobby of the building. There was a TV or something like that we were watching this on. But it, uh, I think, first of all, I think, um, 
what it showed, what that showed to me was when that happened, I was like, wow, th- this is, this is terrible. But what in some strange way, I was like, there's nothing I can do to help. You know, I was doing something else. I wasn't anywhere near the space program. And I felt like I wanted to do something to help or mm. do something. And I wanted to be a part of it. And it made me realize that whatever it is you pick to do in life, you have to really care about. And, um, that I, I think you should feel strongly about what you do strongly enough that you're willing to risk your life or at least risk something, take some risk for it because it's that important to you. And so that accident made me realize that to me, the space program for for whatever, whatever reason to me was the most important thing that I could dedicate my life to. And that if that meant putting my life at risk, I was okay with that. Mm. There's not too many things I would do that for. Maybe we think our families or our kids or you know, our spouses or loved ones we would do that for. But at first, something I would do for a job or a program I believed in, I felt like exploring space was worth that risk. So I think that's that's one thing that helps you go and face these things. I think the other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, when I when I looked up at the, what I was thinking with the trust part of it, because when I first looked up at the space shuttle, my very first launch, it was a night launch. And um, we got out there about three in the morning and the place was deserted because they put fuel in that tank right before the launch. And when they do that, they clear the area. So up to that point in my, my life, when I'd been around a space shuttle, it was always bustling with people and there was a lot of workers and stuff. But once they put the fuel in, they get everybody out of there. So it's deserted. All the support structures rolled back. It's got these brightly lit lights on it. There's smoke coming off of it. It was water vapor, but it looks like there's smoke coming. There's things smoking. And it was making these unworldly noises because mm-hmm. I, I think it was like the cryogenic fuel, the cold fuel, bending the metal of the launch pad. It was like it was like moaning, right? And the thing looked like it was and sounded like it was alive. It looked like a beast, oh, wow. like, like an angry beast. And so after dreaming about all this stuff since I was a little kid, the thought that went through my mind looking up at that spaceship that, that night was – Maybe this wasn't such a good idea, you know. And I was kind of like, I wonder if I could run for. There was this was like uh, six months. My first launch was like six months after the nine eleven attack, and I remember like they had these security guys with us, like these SWAT guys with these big weapons and things for security. I don't think they're worried about terrorists. I think they were there to make sure we'd get on a spaceship. <laughs> but I was like, they're going to run me down, you know, and make me go. So I I, I just got on, and once I got on, um, I felt fine because I was well trained. So one thing I learned from that is that when you, if you're worried about something or scared about something, thinking about it is always worse than doing it. I mean, mm-hmm. you can psych yourself out for just about totally. anything. And that's one thing I learned. So the way they train is they put us, sometimes on purpose, sometimes by accident, you got yourself in a situation and you start learning things about yourself. Like, you know, thinking about it is a lot worse than doing it. Um, there were some situations like in, a, in the airplanes we used to fly, we had a couple of things that were emergency related where I realized that being scared wasn't going to help. This was another thing that kind of surprised mm. me that I was in a situa- situation where it might be sc- almost like you block it out. And it's not going to help me right now. It's going to hurt. I think s- being scared can actually hurt you perform sometimes, right? Being nervous is okay. I think that shows that you care about it and it you, will help you motivate you to, to, to do well. But once it's time to perform, being scared usually doesn't, doesn't help. So it's like, I'm not going to do that because mm. that's going to risk my chances of being successful. So let's not be scared. Let's stick to our plan. But to move forward, I think, was the was the building up of trust in the training that we had, that if something went wrong, we were trained well to react to it, that we had good equipment, the gear is going to be there for us, whether it's our parachutes or harnesses, whatever the gear is going to be there, trust your gear, trust your team, as I said earlier, to help you and then trust yourself. So it's like you're all taking a leap of faith, I think, a lot of times when you're doing things like that, that could be scary. But you know, remember, you're, you're, if you're in that situation like that, you weren't there, you're not there by accident. You're able to handle that situation. Try to, try to. I don't know if "remain calm" is the right word, but certainly don't try not to panic because that'll be that'll hurt you. And that, that's what I think what they trained us was how to put any situation so you're not going to panic. You're going to rely on your training and not make a mistake because even the most well trained crews, things go wrong. I mean, accidents happen in training of mm-hmm. of high performing teams and Navy SEALs and other things. People that are so well trained will still sometimes make a, a critical error. So you want to you want to recognize you're in a dangerous situation and then execute the plan because it's there for a reason mm-hmm. and maybe not think too yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. So speaking to the the training, I want to get into yeah. a little bit of the physical training and requirements mm-hmm. and 
um, you know, what you guys actually did to prepare your muscles for going mm -hmm. up into space and then also, you know, re-entering gravity yeah. and, and all of that stuff. Like, like, what do you have to consider uh, physically before going up into space? Um, the, uh, I, I remember when I was a new astronaut, they would talk about these things, people coming back from a, from a flight or how they performed and so on. The physical part of it is your 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 body's going to go through um, weightlessness, which is not going to put any load on your body unless you put it on there. Just atrophy, right? Your At, body yeah. If you it. did nothing, you know, it's it's really like the ultimate bed rest. It's even worse than that. Like yeah. even us sitting here, right? We're doing, we're moving around, we're fighting gravity. We have to sit upright, but in space, you're just floating. You're not doing anything. So if you were not to do anything over a prolonged period of time, maybe not in a couple of weeks, but if you didn't do anything for a longer period of time up there, your heart would shrink. You would lose. You would mm. piss out your bone mass. You would mm -hmm. you would lose bone mass, bone density, uh, muscle mass. Would you would atrophy terribly. So Even you your digestion uses back. gravity to some extent. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a that's a that's another story I can tell you about. But uh, about <laughs> the moon, I, I, I asked a moonwalker one time what was the best thing about what was it like on a moon. He says the best thing about it is you could finally take a dump. <laughs> because he got, a, yeah, cause he got to the minimal one gravity. Six he goes, oh, he goes, you, Mike, you don't know yet. You're not a, you haven't flown in space yet. But, uh, but you know, you, when you when you you're floating around in space, you just can't go, you know. And finally, get on that moon after a couple of days of floating around. That one six gravity is just enough so you can let loose. This is what he told us the best thing about. I feel it. like that's enough evidence right there that we landed. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're right, exactly. Yeah, that was it. Wasn't the guy I mentioned earlier? That was John Young who told me that. I couldn't believe that. Sweet release. Yeah. I was expecting some kind of, you know. Something profound. Yeah, right? Unbelievable moment, you <laughs> yeah. know, and he said, well, best thing about him, Mike, because only 12 guys did this. We were flying. He was still an active astronaut when we were, when when he told me this, and we were flying. He was a pilot in command in front of me. And we were flying back from California, from the Ames Research Center, not too far from here. And he told me that story. But where were we? You talked about changing yeah, the body. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so you have to, you know, that's another thing. You you can do, diet can help a lot with that. Um, but what I what I remember hearing as as a brand new astronaut from one of the crews that came back that said, the better shape you're in going going into a flight, the better shape sure. you're going to be in coming out. Of course, don't expect to go there and become. <clears throat> you come, you know, that's not a gym you're going to. They do have a gym there that you can work out, especially now in the space station. Yeah, but what you're trying but to do you, the whole that's time, just to slow down. You're just trying to fight exactly it. Yeah. right. You're trying to maintain or not lose too much. Yeah, yeah. really, right? At least maintain. Some people actually get the, the way they the way they've understood the the what they've learned about exercise protocols now they're able to keep people really well fit. That's cool. And and sometimes as as good as they were when they left, maybe and sometimes a little bit better. That's impressive. But there's a 2-hour exercise period on the space station 6 days a week. And it involves cardio and lifts so not lifting you take all these weights you got in his gym and fly them in space. You can lift them with one finger. Yeah, all of them. You know. So what I, is it? So pneumatic? Is it pneumatic? So yeah. What it is? It's kind of like that. It's a. It's a. It's a. The device they have now on the space station. It's. Um. It's called a red. Um, Go with the A stands for, but it's re resistive exercise device, right? Okay. So it. Uh. It's. It's a device that has. It's kind of a contraption, but it works on pulleys and uh, like springs and the TheraBand sort of technology. So the, a TheraBand is really good. We had those. Yeah. You could at least get a bit of a workout with those things. Time against something and work out your shoulders and your arms, and you could do stuff with it. But you have to resist against something. You just can't. You just can't lift weights. So. Right. So that's what they do now on on space station. But what they what I remember this is the better shape you're in going in, the better shape you're in going to be in. Yeah, there's some pictures of it there. Is, yeah. I, I think I'm assuming. So uh, it, it seems like this might be something where the harder you push, the harder it resists. Is that what this machine? How this machine works? Yeah, you can set it in different ways. You okay. can so it's very tunable. Okay, and uh, you'll train on it on the ground. So you'll you'll have to like a prescription, yeah, mm -hmm. of what's going to work for you. But you can get a full body workout. So you can do squats, deadlifts, bench press, curls, everything with this thing. And plus you have an exercise bike to ride and also a treadmill so you get your cardio in. So that's really important to do that, particularly on the space station because you're there for so long. Mm. Mm. Is there like one of you that's kind of running it for everybody else or are you free to do whatever you want? Is there a, a regimen that you're supposed to follow? Are they like, flying oh, trainers yeah, no. up there? <laughs> yeah, well, they, sh they should actually. But the trainers are... Uh, Again, very dedicated people, and they uh, they work with you. They'll work with work with us. You, you're supposed to go to the gym every day, right? So, to ba to back it up a little bit, when I entered this world of uh, the astronaut office, which again comes from the military culture, 
but it was a you you had to more or less work out like that was part of your job we had our gym the mm -hmm. astronaut gym that was built for us to use mm -hmm. where they would you know there was a guy in there that would do our laundry right it was like they tried to make it as easy as possible reserved parking you go in there, you work out in your gym clothes, throw them in the bin, they'll be ready for you later this afternoon if you wanna come back. Mm. Like that, mm -hmm. they try to make it as easy as possible. There's no excuses. You had time in your day to go do this. They would schedule it or you'd go after hours. And I remember my very first, uh, my very first month at NASA, we had the safety and health day at the, at the Space Center. And uh, Bob Cabana, I've named him I think three times in this interview, I haven't spoken about him for a while, but his ears must be ringing. Bob was the chief of the office at the time, a Marine pilot, and he said, he wrote out an email and he said, anyone caught not exercising will be disciplined. Like that was your, <laughs> right? That was, that was it. And I was like, okay. So we were expected to be fit because it really pertained to our jobs. And what was, what was interesting for me is that I hadn't felt like the need to be fit for my job since I was like in high school playing sports. You know, to that, to that, you know it's like, all right, I'll try to be fit and, and for, for health reasons. But the motivation became a lot different yeah. going into the office where it was part of our culture. And that's where people would meet and talk and a lot of rumors were exchanged and socializing was done as well. It was like a cool place to go because you could, you could work out and talk. And the instructors, getting back to one of your questions here, I think they would help us with setting up a regimen for us and would work us out in the gym and then kind of set up things we could do on our own too if we if they weren't around or if we wanted to just come in on our own and they would also give you things to do in space so they were they were called acers astronaut uh strength and conditioning uh astronaut strength astronauts the the, the ascr right so it's astronaut strength conditioning and rehab because they also were in charge of you when you got back to rehab you to rehab you when you got back particularly from the long missions that was important the so they had a you got to know them really well they would run with you they would work you out. They would torment you, uh, you know, whatever they needed to do to get you ready so that you could perform in space and also recover when you got back. Mike, you know, because um, to me, it's, just, it's fascinating because obviously humans evolved with gravity. So everything on our body everything. evolved with gravity. Everything. Digestion, movement, uh, yep. blood flow, brain. Our, our perception of things. I was just going to ask you, what's it like to what's it like to sleep and wake up? You don't have yeah. this the sun rising and setting the same circadian rhythms yeah. all off. Yeah, that's right. So what's it like to sleep and wake up, and what does that feel like? So the 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 sleep the sleep part of it. Let, let, let me go back one second, and I'll try not to lose the, the sleep yeah. thought, but just to set it up a little bit. The most uh, profound difference when you get there that you realize immediately is that your vestibular system is not working. Oh, hmm. So our vestibular system works on gravity and allows us to do stuff like drive a car, ride a bicycle, fly an airplane. That's how you get your proprioception. Everything. Walk around, right. run. Uh, everything is based on that. And it all works with our eye movements. And when there's a conflict between our eye movements and our vestibular system, that's when we're adaptable uh, maybe to get sick. I don't know if that happened in, in the airplane, if you felt a little bit of yeah. nausea. What it is yeah. is that your gyro inside is really getting spun around at 9 Gs or whatever those guys did to you, upside down, and your they eyes are up. seeing something, yeah. and your, your brain, that's why I was saying a second flight is good because your brain has no idea what's going on. Hmm. And it elicits the the reaction to that is nausea. We're really not sure why that we've developed that way. But the same thing like in a car, if you're trying to read yeah. sometimes, oh, yeah. and um, and you're reading it. When I first moved to New York City, where I live now, I used to get I try to read in the back of a cab, and you know you're getting bounced around, and your eyes are saying you're you're still you're reading, but your inner ear is saying no, you're yeah. moving around. And that conflict needs nausea. But you can adapt to that. That's what I was saying in the in the jet. Is that just through practice? Yeah, yeah your okay. brain, because your brain can figure this stuff out, right? So it's okay. like, all right. No, I'm not. I don't need to throw up. I'm safe. This is just what's going on. It can adapt to all those things. So uh, in space, what happens though is that it's completely shut off, right? So hmm. your vestibular is telling your brain you are not moving. You are perfectly still. As you start moving around the cabin, though, now you've got the conflict. The first time they noticed this was on one of the first missions to the moon. And that was the first time they had a, a, ca a cabin, a spacecraft large enough that you could float around in. So when you're just sitting in the seat the whole time, like they were in the early flights, not moving around much, they would adapt to it, and they didn't do a spacewalk till like a few days later, mm -hmm. and they were adapted by then. But they got out of their seats right away, which was unusual uh, before then. In the, in the Apollo uh, missions, one, the one of the first ones to the moon, and the guy started throwing up. They were thinking of actually returning. They didn't know what it was. 
They were oh. thinking of turning him around. They thought he had some kind of crazy space disease. But what it was, it was this, this conflict with the vestibular system. So your brain adapts to that. When I first got to space, if you go upside down, like mm -hmm. if you would, if you guys would hold me upside, I'm not asking you to do this because I know you easily could do this. <laughs> Turn me upside down for a while, right? I'll know I'm upside down. Yeah. My brain knows I'm upside down. Yeah. But in space, if you go upside down. It's the same. Your, your brain thinks that the room is rotated. Not you. Not me. I oh, feel like I'm weird. perfectly Ooh. still because my, oh, that's so wild. it was like this, when I'm looking at your sign in mind pump and when I'm looking at you guys, you guys would be completely reversed. Oh, that's weird. But I'm feeling like I'm sitting here and that's, that's nauseating. So you usually. That's a trip. But now you get used to that after a couple of days. So now your brain has gotten used to this, right? It shuts off the vestibular system. And you come back to earth yeah, and that? it turns back on. So like you were talking about sleeping, right? So sleeping in space takes a little bit of getting used to. You're, you're floating, uh, but you're inside of a, of a sleeping bag, which is attached to something. Attached, in this case of the space shuttle, you get attached it to the wall. Or I put mine on the ceiling because when can you sleep on the ceiling? So you would attach it. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a bed roll. You roll it up when you wake up. So you float, once you get in there, so you're not going to float around and wake up your friends. Or you don't need a pillow, right? Because your head just... Great question. Uh, you, you actually do, believe it or not, Sal, because uh, what they found on the early missions is that we're so used to having something behind our head that these guys are, you know, they're trying to, they couldn't fall asleep because there was nothing behind their head. But if you put a pillow behind your head, your head's just going to float off it. So what we do is, well, but they they strap it to your head. It sounds funny. It sounds really uncomfortable for the psychological reasons. Yeah, just because we just used to having something behind our head. Otherwise, you might jerk yourself trying to. Right, you know, I don't. The guys couldn't sleep, so so what we do is you actually have a band around your head, just a nice cloth band that attaches the pillow to your head. That is so you kind of like wearing a pillow behind your head. Trip. So you feel just because that's how we're used to sleeping. We generally keep it cold. In the space shuttle, I feel like so. there's pranks here. I feel like there's, oh, there's a, all kinds of stuff. I was going gonna on. say there's got to be some stuff where you guys mess. You guys mess with the new guy when with <laughs> stuff like this, you know, <laughs> yeah, float, like spin him around while he's too, sleeping, yeah. or detach his, <laughs> his sleeping bag, snicker bar, just Dude, floats, stuff. Yeah. My, it's, yeah, actually, it's kind of disappointing. Not too much of that, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. A little bit of that here and there, but it's more like showing him the ropes. There yeah. was some silly things, like there was a, uh, we detached him in the spacewalk. <laughs> there was a, there was some silly things, like they do this 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 is like astronaut humor, maybe or nerd humor. I, I don't know where it would fall, but like you get onto the astro van and go out to the launch pad, and and the the, the driver asks you for your boarding pass, <laughs> and all the veterans have like a piece of plastic that says you can board the space shuttle, and none of the rookies have it. It's like oh, you guys can't come. I go really? I'm not getting on the <laughs> space panic because I don't have this joke piece of plastic. It's like little things like that that yeah, are just yeah. kind of, yeah. but nothing is. But you there are there are a couple of things. They're starting. I'm starting to think of them like. I don't know if this is a good example, but um, there's uh, not much airflow in the in the in, in space. Everything float. You know, the, it's not just you that's floating, but the air floats too. So like hot air doesn't rise. You don't get circulation. Oh, that's right? weird. Huh. So you can yeah. literally move him. Oh, it's hot here. It's wow, cold here. It that. doesn't. It, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't circ. So hot air rises. We get convection right. here, and that's how things cool themselves. You know, if you want like a, you don't necessarily things. Sometimes you need a radiator to, if you to reject a lot of heat. But in general, you know, you radiate heat, but the only way to do that in space is to involve fans. So we have mm. fans moving around to circulate the air, and and you know because it won't, it's not going to move at all. And we we have a, a a filter, so that will the air will go through. And so if you're losing something, like you can't find something, it'll end up by the filter eventually. Oh, because it's going to go over there. Yeah. So in the morning, you look at the filter, and it'll be like you know someone's vitamins are in there, or someone's <laughs> watch ended up in there, or. You, <laughs> Mouth piece guard. of underwear or say, hey, you know, why did this get over here? Whatever it might be. I lost my drawers, you know, they're over there. But that that airflow would come up right next to where the uh the the pilot was sitting. So it was an inter in between the, it was a mid deck and a flight deck. So that airflow would would that fan would would then, you know, bring and you mentioned earlier that sort of here bring that air right where the, the pilot was. So you mentioned earlier about your stomach might not be doing out oh, well great. in zero gravity. <laughs> So I can already guess. All right. So I don't get if we want to go there, but no, we're no, there already. So already. You went might there. get gas, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, and if you did, you could direct it, right? <laughs> yeah. So you would, and you'd be in your own state. My friend, is this okay to talk just, about? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. 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 So Rick, I mean, yeah. So Rick, Rick, and you're in your own spacesuit, 
right? You get your own circulation. Oh, it's going to come over your head. Rick Linehan thought he was going to pass out from one of his own one of his own farts. <laughs> he goes like methane poisoning because he was by himself in there. And he's like, oh my god. So and you know he was lower pressure, so your stomach expands. So what they teach you, like in a jet, I don't know if they mentioned this here when you were flying, but if you're if you're going to be in a in an airplane that's a lower pressure, which you probably where you probably wearing oxygen uh -huh. to help with that, your your stomach like a bag of potato chips. Oh it's right, expand so your stomach expands too, and so they tell you, you know, you if you got if you got gas, you got to get rid of it. So in space, this is what happens. So if you wanted to play a prank, put the rookie in the pilot seat and then <laughs> fart by the, and you know, he'll get a, he'll get a that's face awesome. full. See, of that's that a stuff. great prank. You're right with that. Okay, yeah, that's a good. great prank. Awesome. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got stuff like that yeah, you can do. Yeah, did, yeah. Is your circadian you rhythm thrown off though, or do they? How do you? How do you or is it, is it easy to just fall asleep when you're supposed to and wake up? No, I, the, well, circadian rhythm is more. Uh, you go every 45 minutes you get a sunrise and a sunset because it's 90 yeah. minutes. so you get 16 yeah. sunrises and 16 sunsets oh that's weird bizarre so what we've learned uh and it's there's a there's an app that i've done a little work with called time shifter that's based on this stuff that uh one of our flight surgeons and a and a doctor from from harvard medical they they would they would work this shift with us this sleep shift with us because the way you would launch to to go to space was based the time you would launch was based on your target of where you were headed. So if you were going to a target, if you weren't going to, if you are just going to do an orbital flight, you could launch at 2.30 in the afternoon. Doesn't matter. What they would like to do is launch you toward the end of your day. So you would launch into space, do a few things for a few hours. You're not feeling that great anyway because you're getting used to it. Take a take a sleeping pill if you need it or, an, or a, 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 a nausea medicine. We used to take a, a, a shot of something called Finnegan. Mm. Take a, an injection of that in the rear end and that would help you go to sleep and you wake up the next day feeling better. So that was the plan typically, right? You, if you could pick any time you'd want to launch, you'd probably be around 2.30 in the afternoon, get some work done, eat dinner, probably didn't want to eat, maybe go to sleep and feel better the next day. So if you, but if you're going to a target, like to the Hubble or to the space station, there's only a, a, a few, 20 minutes more or less each day that you can launch from the Kennedy Space Center and get there expeditiously. So it's kind of like it's passing over the the uh, the launch pad, right? And then poof, you go and get it. Right. If you launch when it's on the other side of the planet, you're, you're never going to get there, yeah. right? Hmm. So that window is a 20 minute window that moves each day, hmm. right? It changes each day. So you pick the day you're going to go to whoever does that. Uh, we're going to we're going to go to this place. We're going to go to space station on this day. There's a 20 minute window when you can go, and that could be in the morning or the afternoon or middle of the night <clears throat> that you need to launch. And so they again, they want you to be at the end of your day. So they will shift you. So for my first flight, which we had like a 6 a.m. flight, meant we were going to bed. We had a shift to go to bed around 9 or 10 in the morning, right? And then wake up in the evening. Mm. So they did that by getting us, getting our circadian rhythms shifted. And it has to do with uh, if you're a coffee drinker or have caffeine, when you can do that and when you can't. When you can see light, which was interesting, because lights, there are certain types of yeah. lights that'll wake you up. Sunlight, for example, wakes you up. So you would put, they would have shades or make it dark so you could sleep during the day. And they would have these weird lights in the crew quarters that would make, try to make your brain think that you were awake. So they tried to get you on that schedule because once you launched, then you tried to more or less maintain that sleep schedule. So you would, the shift would take place before. You're, earlier, you had mentioned how when you, you know, seeing earth, you felt mm -hmm. for the first time, like this is my home. Earth is my home. Yeah. What's it like working with, uh, astronauts from other countries, international, is there a camaraderie between you? Like you mm -hmm. see the guy from Russia, China, wherever. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter. We're, no. we're all okay. It doesn't. Um, I'm hopefully going to see two of my international colleagues on Monday. They're in New York. Uh, David San Jacques, who's a Canadian astronaut and Gerhard Thiele just texted me. He's a German guy that was in my astronaut class as a German astronaut, but it goes even deeper than that. You mentioned Russians, you know, we have this conflict going on yeah. over in the Ukraine and uh, we still on every American mission to the International Space Station, there's a Russian cosmonaut on board and on every Russian Soyuz to the space station, there's an American on board. And that's done because for safety reasons, you need a mixed crew because say you have, if you had all Russians going up here and all Americans going up here, and then there's an emergency that the Americans have to come home and they all evacuate on the same spaceship. Then you only have Russians on board and there's an American section, right? And the same goes for the Russians. You got to have, you can't just evacuate all the, all the mm -hmm. Russians and only have Americans. So 
for safety reasons, for safety of operations, we still do that. And uh, it it works. I mean, our, our the this, this space programs are still able to perform just as they they always have. The tension between the countries pretty much don't speak about that. We just kind of stick to stick mm -hmm. to business. Um, so we're, it's, it shows to me, it shows maybe a good thing about that is that when you have a goal like that, it doesn't matter where you're from or what your, you know, what your political opinions are about things or whatever's going on with at, at the larger levels in your, in your government, you have to get the job done together. Well, it's a big deal yeah. because, uh, um, you know, of course during the cold war, it was a lot of tension mm -hmm. between the Soviet union yeah. and the United States. Yeah. And uh, people don't realize, I think, um, like what an accomplishment this is, and also just yeah. just working together because that was an yeah. agreement at some point, and it was really like, hey, let's do this thing together, this yeah. thing that we were competing over that was maybe showing our our technological yeah. power or whatever, and we continue yeah. to do yeah. it, which is phenomenal. Yeah, we, absolutely. So, yeah, they they were competing with the Soviet Union to get to get to the moon, and uh, but now we we cooperate with Russia, with the countries of Europe, with Japan, Canada. They just had a, a first two astronauts from the UAE mm -hmm. fly. And they're, they're training with NASA astronauts. So, you know, they're, in some ways, I think we should be working with countries we may not always get along with to Agreed. hopefully try to understand yeah. each other. I mean, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine is a completely different thing. I mean, sure. that's just so freaking horrible that, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, yeah, that's. I don't know if we would be having that same relationship to start that relationship like mm -hmm. it is now. I don't know if that would happen. Um, but we've had this relationship with them for a long time now, for for over thirty years, yeah. where we've been flying astronauts on first space station Mir. They were flying cosmonauts on shuttle. So that relationship was was put together in better times, and still remains. I don't know going forward what would happen. I I, I doubt that anything would happen no. if things don't change. Over there, but right now we we maintain that that working relationship in space. Do you do you look at um, us putting our sights on Mars as another opportunity to create that kind of shared goal with mm -hmm. everybody in the world? And is it just? I know I know like the private sector has come in and mm -hmm. kind of been able to, like Elon Musk has really put his sights on yeah. that. Um, but in terms of the rest of the world and us sort of uh, focusing on like a common goal, do you see that as an opportunity for us, uh, for humanity? Yeah, ab ab absolutely, Justin, I do. And I think I think it's, uh, as you said, uh, the other player in here is the commercial companies. Because governments can't, the governments that you know, taxpayers' money and uh, have to be good stewards of that and can't do everything they want to do. Um, it was different during the Apollo missions when they went to the moon the first time. We had strong motivation. It was, yeah, it was almost like a national defense That's thing because right. we're competing mm -hmm. against the Soviet Union for control of the techno technological world back then. And we had and everybody so was behind way, it. There was right, no question by showing that we could do that. By you know, we meaning the United States could do that. Um, it, it it showed what we were able to do. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a peaceful way to show capability. And that was a huge national goal. Once that was done, the support for the program kind of went away. The last three missions to the moon were canceled. They were supposed to have three more landings. Yeah. And for budget cuts, they stopped them. So those there's these big rockets that are in different places in our country, Kennedy Space Center, Johnson Space Center, and uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. Those are real moon rockets, the Saturn Vs that never went to the moon. They were supposed to go to the moon, and oh, they didn't go for budget cuts. So once that goal was attained... That was kind of it. And we've been in that mode where it's you know, the space program is an important thing for the country, but it's not as important as other things we have going on that, you know, keeping people fed and alive and healthy and these other things that we spend our money on, right? So um, I think what's been helpful is with these private companies now finding ways that they can make money or think they can make money on in their business plan that there's private investment now. And I think that combination of not just the United States, but all the other countries around the world, uh, some of which are very wealthy too, that want to be players, um, along with these private enterprise. I, I think that's the only way to go is to get everyone involved to do something like Mars. I think it's, uh, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm a huge supporter because um, if we could find a way to turn these endeavors into profit, yeah, 
um, then it's not just a, a waste, I would say, of resources, even Correct, though we yeah. may have this drive to explore. Space tourism, yeah. right? Well, I mean, I know with Elon, I mean, they've, they, they've cut the cost of launching satellites into space significantly yeah. through their technology, which yeah. could have some profound uh, benefits. So I, I'm all Absolutely. for it. But any fears around that? Because I don't, do they follow the same regulations or it's pretty heavily, heavily regulated, right? They have to pass so many tests and show so many things before. It or is, is it not? It is and it isn't. Okay. Interesting enough, Sal. The, the government did some interesting, I think first, the, the, the purpose of, one of the purposes of our government that, that I think that I saw at NASA that like our administrators and our leadership had was that we were supposed to help the country in any way we can. And that includes economically, that if there's a, a technology that NASA or the government can develop and then hand over to private enterprise, like airplanes. Mm -hmm. A lot of airplane development was done for military reasons in you know, World War I first, and then even World War II, we started experimenting with jets and breaking a sound barrier afterwards mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, turning that over to commercial enterprise, now we have this thriving commercial airline business. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that something like that can also happen with, with space travel. So I think that, that that's part of what the government um, should be doing is is encouraging these things. I'm sorry, your question though, Sal, that I- Oh, just are the regulations- Oh, the regulations, yeah, 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 thank yeah. you. Thank you for reminding yeah. me of that. So what's interesting about it, I think, is that there actually was no real regulation put on these commercial companies. Hmm. They, the FAA is for uh, for flying, uh, F, for aviation, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, they kind of regulate that. NASA was the only game in town for mm -hmm. launching people into space. But the government kind of gave them a, pass on regulations but i think that's ex that expires like pretty soon hmm. that that mm. that kind of it may be extended but they didn't want to over regulate them um to kind of cut costs stunt and the, to stunt the growth because if you over regulate nothing's going to happen yeah so they didn't want to regulate too much but they're kind of keeping a watch on what's going on. Well, there's a lot of I motivation for them not to screw up. That I mean, is the Elon other thing. screws up once, that's you it. You kill somebody, that's it. You yeah. know? And Nobody it's, wants uh, to do it it's, anymore. It's, it's, it's also the, the press behind it. It's kind of like um, you know, driverless cars. You know, yeah. People mm -hmm. get hurt on, with people driving a car. All the time. All the time. But as soon as a driverless car knocks, you know, hurts someone, you know, we don't trust these things anymore, right? And they may still be much safer than people driving. Right, right. I don't know if that's true or that not. Is. I'm just throwing crap out yeah. there. But but in this case, you know, as soon as you kill somebody, then it's all it's not fun and games anymore. Particularly if you kill uh, you know, a civilian or a paying customer or someone like that, uh, there's probably not gonna be that much tolerance for it. So for them to be successful in their business, they have to they you know, they they gotta Very not motivated. hurt people. But they are much safer. Um, for example, the SpaceX vehicle is mu I mean, the space shuttle was was pretty dangerous for a number of reasons. We had those two major accidents. Mm -hmm. We had where we lost the crew and the vehicle. Seven people were killed on each one of those accidents. Challenger, we referred to with the Krista McAuliffe was mm -hmm. on board, and then the Columbia one. Um, after I was an astronaut, we after my first flight on Columbia, we lost Columbia on the next flight. The whole crew and the the, the vehicle gone. Um, shuttle was was dangerous. We that was calculated. At a, the odds of getting killed, like total loss of life and and vehicle, uh, was one out of seventy five. <sighs> right? Gosh. So now one out of seventy five. Like if you had a if you were taking a bet to make money and you had a seventy four out of seventy five chance, you'd probably sure. But, you know, but if not, it was your life, but if your life it, it's not you know it's not, like, all right. I'm probably going to be okay, <laughs> but that's not the kind of risk that the government even would want to take of with people. It's more like one out of fifteen hundred was the number sort of like as an acceptable risk. So it was a it was a great risk going on the uh, on the space shuttle. I'm not sure what the odds are for the like the, the SpaceX vehicle, but it is much safer. The automated systems help. The technology we had with the space shuttle was the the, the crew handling almost everything. Wow! Mm. So it was even the even the emergencies had to be handled. Most of our training for the shuttle for working the spacecraft was working emergencies, right? Which were never going to happen, as you, I think you mentioned a minute ago, right? It's either going to be a good day or a bad day, and so you never. This stuff's never going to happen. But we had to know every electrical failure, hydraulic failure, engine failure, cabin issue. All this stuff had to be worked by the crew. The pilot on my first flight, and the pilots got most of this training. We had some of it as a mission specialist, but we were doing spacewalks and other stuff. But the pilots, the test pilots we had, were trained on this stuff, and I asked them. How much of your of our training did you not use on on our flight? And he said ninety nine point nine nine percent of his oh. training he did not use at all. 
So now it's handled, most of it's handled, including the emergencies, by the automated systems that they have, AI and all this other stuff they've got going in these spaceships, which actually makes it much safer because it's, it's going to handle all those problems without the crew having to get involved. Also, the way the system is built, it has its own um, like ejection system, a, an abort system where it can separate from the rocket. The shuttle, there was no way to get out of it. And, and we had no, we had, you didn't have an abort option until after the solid rocket boosters left. So you had nothing you could do for two and a half minutes. Whereas with this system that they have now, you can separate from the launch vehicle. So if there's, an, if there's a problem with the vehicle, you can get the crew away from the, from the launch vehicle in the cabin. Wow. The spacecraft can, can separate. So for that reason alone, it's, it's, it's much safer. So it's, it's, a, it's a safer way. That it's reusable. They're able to return the boosters and use them over and over again. You mentioned how it's, it's allowing more people to go you don't have to be a fully trained astronaut. And even for astronauts, it requires less training to go so they can concentrate on other things. I teach at Columbia, the university in New York City. My students have had two experiments in space. They had one go to the space wow. station for a month. Huh. Imagine doing it when I was, you know, even just a couple of years ago, that would have been impossible. But they flew a biomedical experiment on the space station for a month, and then it was returned on a SpaceX vehicle. And they were able to analyze wow. the data. What are they trying to do this stuff? Before? What are they trying to study up there? The effect Crazy. of radiation or zero gravity? On all, all types of things. Um, in this case, it was looking at uh, the way um, antibiotics and medicines work in zero gravity, and uh, so it, things. They're studying disease. Um, is kind of an interesting thing in space. Uh, the way that uh, different uh, different uh, bacteria will. Uh, will generate themselves, right? They'll do it differently. They do it quicker in zero gravity for oh, some wow. reason. Um, but that's what happens. So they're able to study like the effect of medicine, uh, the, the how things, how germs will populate. They can do that differently, let's say better maybe in space. Things behave differently in space. So uh, mixing um, materials, you can't necessarily mix everything that you'd like to in in gravity and on earth because things have different weights to them. They'll separate. They won't combine the way you want to, but they can do that in space. Oh, interesting. So they can develop things that you can't even imagine here on earth. And you could do that in space. One good thing I think about these opportunities for private citizens, let's say people who aren't career astronauts mm -hmm. to go is that a, a, a research, you know, some people want to go to take a look at the, you know, Look around. They won a Twitter contest. They get a birthday present for eighteen million dollars, and their dad sends them. <laughs> and he held these like somebody said, you know, all right, this is like for tourism. But there's also uh, the opportunity now to fly researchers who are doing research into cancer or DNA or whatever it might be. They don't have the time really to take seven years out of their life off to go. First of all, go through the NASA selection process, get through all that stuff, and then do their experiments. You know, fifteen years later. So what it does give us the opportunity now that with the less training involved that you could fly an expert who has an idea of something that they want to do in space, either they can train the astronauts to do it or they can even go themselves to perform those, those studies or those experiments. Mm -hmm. And companies are interested in doing this as well for economic benefit to use space as a mm -hmm. place to, to as, a, as a laboratory to maybe come up with new technologies and new procedures and new new drugs or whatever it is that they're, new pharmaceuticals or whatever it is they're looking at, um, but also as a way to develop those for, for economic benefit as well. So that's opened up now with the privatization of it. Mike, how do you guys deal with the, are, are you exposed to a lot of radiation up there, right? Just because yeah. you're out of the atmosphere and uh, is there any yeah. preparation or anything you have to do or, or they just say, hey, we're going to try and block as much as we can Pretty and much they that. try and block as much as they can. So the higher you get, the higher altitude you get, like even on Earth. Yeah, in a plane, in, right? When you're in a plane, you're going to get more, uh, hopefully the, the plane is protecting you. Plus, you, so that, you know, that's one, you, when you're up on a mountain even, right? So when you're up on a, on a mountaintop, you've got to be more aware of the, of the sun exposure you have than when you're mm -hmm. down at sea level. So the higher we get up, the thinner the atmosphere that protects us is, that's where we're going to, we're susceptible to more radiation, right? When you, when you get to space, you're above the atmosphere. The radiation belts we have do protect us, but you're going to get a much bigger dose in space than you're going to get even in an airplane or, or, or below. Where we were at Hubble, 100 miles higher than space station, we got a significantly higher dose. 
they just track it is what they do. So they try to protect you as much as you can in the spacesuit, in the uh, in the spaceship itself. Um, you're still protected from the radiation belts of our planet that mm -hmm. kind of acts like a like a force shield to absorb most of that radiation. You always have a dosimeter uh, on you when you're in space, so they oh, measure really? it. So you can see. Yeah. Uh oh, I'm getting too much. Well, you can't see it. It's a piece of plastic that you kind of hand in. And then I don't really. Oh, you don't know what's going on. No, if I, if I have a problem, they're supposed to tell me. But <laughs> but I, I have Probably sometimes for I wonder. anxiety that way. Yeah. Well, sometimes I wonder. But it's better, better, better just, you don't know so many things sometimes. Yeah, right. I had a, a Snoopy toy when I was a kid, right? A Snoopy toy that I had as a kid when I was watching Neil Armstrong on the moon. And I used to play with him and pretend like I was an astronaut. And I brought him to space with me, right? So. He's, a, he's at, right now he's at the Charles Schultz Museum. They're having a Snoopy in oh, Space wow. exhibit up in Santa Rosa. That's great. So the Snoopy flew in space with me. So the Intrepid Museum in New York wanted to uh, have him on display for a little bit. So I said, yeah, sure, but he's got, he's had a rough life, Snoopy. I got him when I was nine. And his, his health, I'm no, I, no, I think that when I was six, I got him. In 1960, I was six years old. I dropped him on a concrete. His helmet broke. Then his leg broke. You know, he's kind of been rough. He's had a rough life. He's old. He's like almost as old as I am. So I said, you know, he's he's kind of bro broken up. I said, glue him back together. He goes, no, no, we'll take care of him. We're a museum. So I get him at the at the Intrepid Museum, and I get a call like a couple weeks later. I go, Mike, we're looking at your Snoopy, and you know, he's got the broken leg, but he's also got a broken arm. I'm like, really? And he said, he's and his little tail, his little, his little tail's broken. He goes, and his spacesuit is like all kind of like, you know, it looks like it's kind of been worn, but not in a normal way. And the only thing we can think of is, was he exposed to a lot of radiation? Oh, and I'm no. like, well, yeah, he, he was. was he was in me. space with me. <laughs> I'm like, well, that must be it. And they go, yeah, wow. that's what's radiation exposure. It's like, you know, that's what we see. And I go, well, what are we going to do? And I go, oh, no, no, we can fix them. We just, we never saw anything like this before. And that's what we suspected. That's what it seems like. And we're like, okay. So I hang up the phone. I'm like, what about me? <laughs> and I was out on the Snoopy. spacewalks, which were even worse. And Snoopy wasn't with me on those. And I tell you what, Sal, my hair was not white. When I went to space, you kidding me? I'm sorry, I had like regular colored hair. Wow! And then I come back, I'm like, two I've weeks noticed later, that I going great. Right? Yeah. It was like, yeah. And then one, and I was on a, I was going to go on a T38 in a flight. I was going, what's going on with your hair, man? You know, a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't. Like, so I don't know if they're not telling me everything. <laughs> <laughs> that might be, that might be part of it. But this goes similar to this piece of plastic. Wow. It was in our uh, flight suit when we launched. It was in the checklist to remove it from this pocket we had to put in our in-flight garment. So whatever shorts you're wearing or pants you're wearing, it's always got to be with you. Mm -hmm. And when you go on a spacewalk, there were on our we had a cooling garment we would wear. It's a really cool pair of uh, long underwear with tubes to keep us cool with water to go over it. We had a little pouch to put that that uh, dosimeter in. So then you would then you'd put it back in your launch suit when you came came home, and they would get it from you on landing, and they'd read it. And then I didn't hear anything from then. So I think it's okay. <laughs> but suppose they tracked it. Because you can't, you know, based on your age and your gender and these other things, there's only so much radiation. Uh, you know, we've had some people get treated for with radiation for cancer and so on. And that's part of their lifetime. Yeah. You have a lifetime limit, apparently. Yep, yep. And uh, so they're supposed to so keep track So you can't get x-rays anymore. Basically, <laughs> I don't know. I'm still getting them. They haven't told me anything, so I don't want to know. So I think I'm all right. Do you see anything weird up there? Yeah, I was yeah. just gonna ask. Yeah, you. anything. And are you Any allowed? Unusual to say? fast you moving objects. I, 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 there's no. I, I can tell you anything here, right? So, uh, I'll tell you. It's cool stuff I saw that I could. I understood what it was. Like micrometeorites coming in below you. Okay. Right. So you're out What's there floating like? around. Just a it's like you know, like a shooting star. See over your head. Yeah. Sometimes, if you're lucky to see them at night, rare to see those. Like I saw those looking down, looking down from space. You see them shooting. It's just a, like a shot, like a, below you, coming into the atmosphere. That was pretty cool. Thunderstorms at night. Oh yeah, it really. That's cool. got to look weird. You really, especially huh. like over like the ocean. Most of our planet is ocean, by the way. Yeah. I think we know we know that, right? Yeah. You learn yeah. that. Yeah. It's like two thirds or three quarters. I think it must be growing, because you look over to when you're out there. It's mainly water. You're over, and then I remember my, the first time looking out the window. We're coming over the Indian Ocean. We hit Africa. After all this water, 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 bang. Like, great. You know, Africa, big continent. It was like gone in a blip, and you're over water again. It's like all water. If you're in space and someone asks you, huh. where are we? The easiest thing to say, the best thing to say is over the Pacific. Because that's probably where you are. Because mm -hmm. it's so it's mainly water that we're saying. So you see the, the thunderstorms at night over the ocean. There's like probably no one down there. Maybe there's a boat in the middle of it out there. But, but they're happening, and... And you you can't see any because the cloud the clouds kind of 
dark and everything, so you don't see any reflection of the moon or anything on the ground. But you'll see the the, the lightning go off, and it like a very bright orange, yellow, red kind of color, and it will light up the clouds, and you'll see all the veins in the clouds below you. Ooh, that's cool. Really cool color, and you see that, and it kind of like you can see like shake, and then it's not just one; it's like multiple, and it, it's almost like they're communicating. It's like the like boom, 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 and then it'll stop. And then boom, 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 they'll go off. It's because they, they kind of, and that that was pretty cool. Uh, seeing the stars at night, stars don't twinkle in space. Stars twinkle on Earth because it's the, the lights. Yeah, from okay. the atmosphere. Twinkle, twinkle, little star was written by a dude on Earth. He goes in space <laughs> at perfect points of light. So those are like really cool things, but you kind of, kind of understand what you're looking at, a sunrise or a sunset. Mm. You'll, you, every 45 minutes, you'll go through that transition and it's a huge transition in heat as well. So in the sun, direct sunlight, it could be a couple hundred degrees above zero and in the darkness, it's the darkest dark I've ever experienced. Uh, and so it's, when you're it's, doing the walk outside, you, mm -hmm. you're going to get heat, heat uh, well, hot, you have, cold. You're kind of the, the, the space suit and the shuttle regulates that. So right. it, doesn't make it that drastic and you do have, but you do have temperature control. Mm -hmm. You're typically more concerned about overheating because your body is working and mm -hmm. you're inside an enclosed spacesuit. So you have, usually you have your cooling on pretty, uh, pretty significantly to keep you cool. But you, as you're, as you're coming around from orbit every 45 minutes, you'll feel the warmth of the sun, for example, before you'll see it. And it's kind of, when you go through those transitions, it's kind of like you're, if you're in the ocean or a lake and you get like a cold or a warm current, you feel it down in your bones. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like. So you'll feel the warmth of the sun before you'll see it. And then you just wait a second and you'll see the sun. I remember the first time I saw the sun in space, I realized the first time I was looking at the sun in a black sky, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Huh. And then you look back at the earth and you can see this transition between night and day. We call it the Terminator. It's the, it's the day night line and it's moving. Like it's just tracking across the planet. And what's what that is? It's the rotation of the Earth mm -hmm. that you're looking at, and it's really slowly, slow and steady, but doesn't hesitate, doesn't hiccup, just keeps moving. And I got the sense of permanence to that motion. That's what hit me was that this has been going on for a long time, and it's going to be going on for a long time after all of us are gone. This ballet between the Earth and the Sun and the Moon and the stars. Now this is there was a permanence to it. So all that was cool stuff, but I kind of understood what I was looking at. But there was something I saw, guys. What'd you see? <laughs> that, uh, come on. That, uh, no, I'm serious. This is something, and I, I haven't even, can I take my jacket off for a second? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know it's, it's getting real. It's getting, yeah, it's getting, I, I, I don't know yeah, what it fine getting into the good stuff, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's something that um, I've only really thought about the last couple of years. This is a weird thing, I think. And I've got, the, the guy who I was out there with, was his name, the guy was out spacewalk, it was Jim Newman. And it was my first spacewalk. And we were, got ahead, we did the spacewalk, that spacewalk went really well. And so we got more stuff to do at the end, which delayed us and made it longer, which was fine because we were happy to stay out there. But uh, we were doing like a test of these latches on the, on the telescope with a power tool. They wanted to read the torque, it was like a get ahead thing. They wanted some data on what the torque was like. So they want to break the bolts and they were, it was kind of like a little experiment on how the telescope bolts were doing on these door mm -hmm. latches and whether or not we had to try to repair them. So we're doing, like we're doing some turns with this power tool and then we're reporting down to the ground. Okay, we got this much torque on this one. And we're kind of waiting around, nothing's going on. And we're going through one of these transitions. It just so happened. We were in darkness and we were coming over California and Newman was from, uh, he grew up in San Diego and he's hanging off the edge of the telescope. And as we're going into the sun, we see the Terminator moving across right where California was, right? Coming out of like Arizona and Nevada and now going over to California. Newman's like, good morning, California. We're kind of like this kind of, and I'm looking at him. I can see him looking. It's kind of cool. And then he comes up next to me as we're waiting for another instructions. And I look right in front of me and I, I've got, what I need to do, what I really need to do is look at my helmet camera. Cause I bet this camera and my helmet camera tapes. There's a blob of, maybe this is going to, I'm going to hope this doesn't like disappoint you guys. Because <laughs> it's not like an alien or anything. Uh, okay. But there Paper was clip. a blob of some black tar or, sh I don't know, it looked like tar to me, right? Like a black, weird looking tar thing that was stuck to the telescope, right? Maybe about the, you know, the, the size of a quarter, let's say, but like kind of a rocky looking. I've seen enough sci-fi movies to tell you not to touch it. Yeah. 
that's exactly what I did. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, <laughs> ooh. It's going to go on your finger. I'm not, and turns- I'm not, I don't know what the hell that is, right? And I'm like, so I didn't want to say, no, and look at that. So I'm like, you know, get his attention and, and, and I point to the, and he looks over at this and he looks at, we can see each other through our helmet and he's like, <laughs> I'm like, no freaking way. Just leave it there, right? And then we went on with our task and went inside and never talked about it. That was 20 years ago. And I only remembered that like about, a, I, don't, I don't know, maybe a year ago. I was like, Someone asked me that question. I'm like, nah, I never really saw anything. Oh, what about that tar? You know, like you would think if you were a curious person, maybe you would, you should have, I don't know, scooped it up. Done something. Yeah, Yeah, but we wouldn't want any part. It's like, this not on the checklist. We're not messing with that. (laughs) You know, I had to, we're not looking for alien tar, but I don't know what that thing was because if it was a rock, it would have broken. It it would have put a hole. There's plenty of, there's like holes in the, in the, or dings, dents. In the From in the telescope, debris, yeah, right? boom, boom. But this thing was somehow stuck. stuck. Oh, <laughs> it was it's like a like a so, and it was going that as fast as we were saying earlier. So I don't know. I think maybe in my that's retirement, weird. that's weird when you think about what you said about even the foam, how the foam could penetrate. Yeah. Like so, right? How, what kind of how matter did this would, thing get on there? What yeah. was this thing? Yeah. Mm. It wasn't launched like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that, maybe it's not there anymore. Maybe I don't maybe I don't know what that thing That was, was aliens, I think. Yeah. I'll, I'll got, got, I don't know what it was, but I know exactly when it happened. I could need to find, I need to look at my I got all my tapes. I should go home and do yeah, that. Absolutely. Oh, you got all the tapes. Oh, yeah, I got all my got all my helmet. Yeah, yeah. How to show up on a tape? That. I think it was right in front of me. Great. The CIA yeah. just took your tapes away now. Yeah. You're going to go home. <laughs> nah, and <you're> not gonna. <laughs> How how far yeah, away are we from uh commercial flights to space, you think? First, let me ask you, was that good enough for a weird thing to see? That was oh, yeah. Yeah. That was great. Because right, it wasn't like I didn't see, a, you know, E.T. show up yeah, or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, but how far <laughs> yeah. are we from what now? Commercial space flights. Well, we have them. You know, Jeff Bezos and Captain Kirk and William Shatner yeah, went to space. Yeah, yeah. So those are, what do you, by commercial, do you mean like tourism? Like average yeah. person. Yeah, like, you know, like one of us decide, hey, we want to pay whatever the ticket is and we can go. Yeah, okay. well, if you've got like millions of bucks, you can uh, you can try that, I guess. It's a lot of money. I, so, so we we have a kinda, bet. This is a real bet. The other yeah, one was okay, a joke. Ahead. This is All a real right. bet. The yeah. bet is that, because we, we had this big old argument on the podcast mm-hmm. once, that, that I said they'll have machines that'll wash your dishes for you. Not a dishwasher, but an actual robot, robot. will wash your dishes yeah. for you. And he says, that won't, that's not going to happen uh, for a long time. He says, we're going to have affordable commercial flights in space before that. So we're like, made this huge bet. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do I think? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I think space flights might come first. Oh. And the reason, no, the reason I'm saying that though, is not because I think either one is possible. I'm just wondering which one would have have the um, the financial benefit for whoever's making sure, these things. You sure, know what yeah. I mean? Right. And I think like space flight has always been prohibitive because it's too freaking expensive. Yeah. And and it's just not possible for anybody to be able to build a rocket ship unless they were a government. So I think that I'm just I'm not a you know I'm not a an investment guy or anything like that for Shark Tank or anything. But I'm thinking like. I'm just wondering. It seems like that's going to take a lot of technology. I'm not sure. Um, so what led the debate for me was I think the, like a dishwasher people really needed, but and it was affordable. But uh, to have like a robot, I don't know. Yeah, uh, and that they, sounds expensive. We had a kid in here one time that was mm-hmm. uh, I forget what his degree was that he was going to. But they they were mm-hmm. doing a lot of stuff on AI technology, and he says that the the there's a huge challenge for uh, the robot to be able to distinguish whether the dish is even dirty or not. Ah. And so, like we we can make things that pick up them, put it down, but to recognize a dish that's dirty versus a clean one, and no right. one, like that, that we're a lot further away from that than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, and so that started this debate, and then that's where it sunk. And I said, no, we're going to have commercial flights to space before we'll have a dishwashing robot inside the house. Yeah, we might. I mean, because there's like the the companies like Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos's mm-hmm. company, and SpaceX, um, Virgin Galactic. Uh, uh, Richard Branson's company, they're, you know, they're economically motivated to do these things and the, it's, yeah. it's available now. Yeah. It's just, it's expensive still. Yeah. But so the price has to come down. For them to be economically viable, the price has to come down. And yeah. they, they realize Which that. Which innovation technology. Yeah. yeah right. So I mean, from that standpoint, the technology yeah. need to do the dishwashing thing. I'm not sure if the payoff is there yet. You know, I think that the price has to come down. Like the price of space flight has come down. Yeah. Um, even though it's ridiculously expensive. 
So you you by far are the have the highest education out of anybody else we've had on this podcast. So we're going to go and take you as an authority. In that, <laughs> there you go, man. In <laughs> no, that throw argument. me out there. Yeah, sure. so, so, <laughs> yeah, until someone sense. else with multiple PhDs and masters comes on here, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> comes in here yeah, to yeah, debate. Got, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, I'm going to take that My, as a win for me. Gave you a little <laughs> step above, but yeah. it's got to be proven still. Go Mike, what's that, what's the transition been like to, to go from astronaut? Because that's such a such a peak, right? Such a pinnacle. What's the transition? What's the transition to go from astronaut to now? You're not flying in space. Mm -hmm. You said you're you're teaching. Yeah, has that been tough or? Um, I I, I miss it. I think the the worst yeah. of it was probably um, right after leaving. Uh, there's a chapter in my book I talk about knowing when to pivot. Mm. And uh, I was so I flew in 09, and I was still an active astronaut. That was the shuttle program ended a few years later. And I was hoping maybe I might get assigned to one of those last shuttle flights, but the timing didn't work out. And I was offered a year after my first, my, my last flight, I was offered uh, by my good friend and the chief of the office, her name is Peggy Whitson. She offered me a, a chance to replace a guy to go to uh, the ISS on a Soyuz, on a Russian vehicle. Mm. And, uh, you know, I was, it was an, like, well, I want to put you on this flight. You're going to replace them oh, like wow. now. <clears throat> and I said, I got to, let me give me some time to think about it. Right. So she said, right, take, take the evening and then let me know tomorrow morning. <laughs> and, uh, so I talked about it at home and I thought about it and I went in and said, no, that's the timing's not right. You no, know, the, it was what was going on in my personal life and the ages of my kids. And I had already flown in space a couple of times. I think for I think really when I think about that the decision to turn it down was it was more that I I felt satisfied in some way of what I had done. I never thought that that would be possible in uh, in my space career, and I think I was ready for something else. At that point, I had been an astronaut for fourteen years, so I hung around another four years and did did stuff in the office um, until I, until I found what I really wanted to do next, which was to become a university professor and to write and speak and do things that could, could educate and inspire is what the hope was. And, uh, talk to you guys, stuff like that. Right. Excellent. And, um, but that, that was, that was really tough to give up on a dream job that I worked so hard to get and then got, and then loved it. Most, most, most of it was, was absolutely wonderful. But to face the the for me and for me it was, I think it's I've had enough, and it was really hard to admit that. I mean, some one of my colleagues, who's much older than I am, is still there. His name is Don Pettit. He was one of my classmates. He's going to fly in space and turn seventy years old in wow. space. Wow, that's, that's cool. Can you imagine he's going on a long duration with another one, awesome. and he's hung in there. So, you know, some some people do that, and I think about well, you know, should I have done that? I think. A lot of it had to do with what was going on personally, how I felt about things, and 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 I I just felt like I couldn't commit to that flight at that time, and and then once I turned that flight down, I was like, what am I doing? What am I telling myself? Because sometimes you think you're going to act or behave a certain way, and then mm -hmm. a decision is put in front of you, and 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 you make it, and you're like, whoa, okay, that kind of did that surprise me? Did I know I was going to say that? What does that tell me about what I what I just did? I think. I think so. I don't know if this is, you know, I'm still learning about things, you know, but in general, but I think that when we're, ever, when we're faced with a big decision in life, whether it's something in our personal life or a relationship or a job opportunity, when it's huge, there are, there are times where those come a few times in our life and it's not a no brainer. Like for me, becoming an astronaut was a no brainer. Like mm -hmm. there was no, there was no doubt in my mind. I was saying yes to that. But I think, a lot of other things we do is kind of like, you know, there's always regret or should I do this? I think some decisions there's always going to be regret in one way or the other. And not that you want to think this way, but I, f I feel like looking back on it, what I did is I tried to minimize the regret I would have. Mm -hmm. There would be regret if I would have, I, I left and I experienced that regret of saying, ah, oh, I should have stayed in there longer and maybe tried for another space flight. But there's also regret if you stay too long because you're not giving you a chance to do something else. So those decisions are the tough ones to make. And uh, I, you know, I, once I turned down that flight, which I had to do quickly because I was given that, that timeline, um, I started thinking about, well, what do I want to do next? And that's when I, I had worked as a professor before I was at Georgia tech the year before I was selected as an astronaut. I was doing some adjunct work 
over at Rice University in Houston. And uh, then I was made an offer to return to where I went as an undergrad and go back home to New York uh, at Columbia. And uh, that was a that was a good move, I thought. It, it was a chance to be in a, a media capital, a chance to go home, get good pizza again. <laughs> you know? So, uh, and that, that's what I decided to do. But these are not these are not easy decisions to make. It's hard to know when it when it's time to move on. You know, when it's uh, when you've you've gone from one phase to the next. Alan Bean, who I've, I mentioned him earlier, the fourth guy on the moon, who talked about leadership and other things, became a mentor of mine. And when he left, he walked on the moon. Then he was on Skylab for a long duration flight that was back in the 70s and then he he was thinking about what he wanted to do should he stay for another flight or should he do something else and he was an artist he is an art. he, he, at that time he's he's passed now he's he's gone but but he was uh he was very artistic he was able to paint and he decided to dedicate the next phase of his life to painting and uh he said never look at anything as an as an ending Look at it as that next phase, and what he did very successfully was paint his experiences as an as an astronaut, his experiences on the moon. No one can communicate the way the way he can about what it was like to have the experiences he had, particularly those on the moon. I mentioned he went to Skylab, but his paintings are all about the moon and and his camaraderie and his friendships and depicting all these. I mean, it's, it's quite quite extraordinary what he was able to do, and so. I felt like I can't paint. I can't even draw a stick, a stick figure. I, I just can't. Um, but I felt like I could help tell the story of these experiences through writing like like with the book and with my teaching and doing things like talking to you guys. So excellent. Mike, so thanks for listening. Yeah. Mike, yeah I don't know if it's, awesome. uh, I have one last question. Mm -hmm. just because it's a personal itch. I don't know if it's too personal or not, um, but I'm curious. Yeah. I, I, do they pay astronauts well? Can you get rich being an astronaut? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, with such a high education accolade, and yeah. stuff like that, you guys could go do so many other careers and make a lot of money. You obviously then choose to do that, uh, not because of that at all. No, no, you can't. You're actually you're paid as a government employee. That, that's all so you're say. Yeah. You're on the government <laughs> pay scale. Yeah. So you're a GS. There's like a GS. The government service. I think it still works this way. It goes like from one to fifteen. Uh, 15 is the highest. And then there's steps within there, like one to 10. So uh, you can get up there. I forget where we were hired. We were pretty high on the government service level, especially if you get a few years of experience, you kept getting promoted. But no, you're not making, you're not making all that much money. You're, you're paid comfortably. Yeah. Okay. But you're paid like any other government employee. Okay. So, but, but you, there's could, no you could work your way up though. You can work your way up to the to the top of the uh, or near the top of the government pay scale, yeah. but <laughs> but nobody can Google that and find out. Get, nobody's yeah, yeah. doing it to get rich. No, you're in you're in it for you. You have there are many opportunities to do that more than especially with the education, other things you have going on. You're not gonna no, and and you, we also didn't get like any. We didn't get paid overtime. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't get any comp time. We did not even get hazardous duty pay. Oh, what? <laughs> really? Right, which was interesting because like when we were flying, the, the guys who were working in our jets to put us in, they got hazardous duty pay. The people that put us in the spaceship, they got hazardous duty pay. But you're pay. in everybody <laughs> but you guys. We didn't get hazardous duty <laughs> That's pay. That's kind of funny. The only thing, the only extra, we, we did get a flight bonus. And uh, so it's a government program, right? I'll tell you about our flight bonus. Our government program, is it, part of it is like when you go on travel orders, when you go travel, you're on orders, right? You're traveling for the government. So say you're going on a business trip. We're going to come out here to to, uh, to San Jose. It would be, you know, from from Houston to San Jose and return, right? That's your trip. Mm -hmm. You're going to return back home. You're going to be gone these days. Uh, lodging cost, you know, they'll give you money for lodging. They'll take, you know, that this is what per diem, you know, you get you get food and some of the stuff you, you know, you per diem for all that stuff, blah, 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 you know. So that's all transportation, airfare, it's all that. So and that's, that's what the government is paying to send you on this trip. Okay. Going to space, I get called in from the secretary and she goes, Mike, you need to sign your travel orders. I go, what travel orders? She goes, for your space flight. And I go, this is a joke? She goes, no, this is a government operation. You get travel orders. It says, from Kennedy Space Center, Florida, to low Earth orbit, <laughs> end return. I was very happy to see the end return. <laughs> you know, at least the government's trying to get me back, right? So it's a low Earth orbit, end return. And then I'm reading the rest of it. Uh, transportation. Provided you're going on a spaceship, hmm. 
Food provided. They're going to feed you. <laughs> Orange tea. Lodging provided. <laughs> yeah. Lodging provided. Uh, lodging. Everything's provided. Bump, 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 bump. Everything's like zeroed out. At the bottom, miscellaneous and incidental expenses, $3 per day. <laughs> wow. So they couldn't. I'm sure, like some, you know, some what bean is counter. toothpaste. What is that? What, well, they was, whenever that? you'd go on travel, you would get like money to, for you know meal money, like forty dollars yeah, yeah. a day yeah, or whatever yeah, they were yeah. going to pay you, yeah. right? And uh, that's what it was. And you'd get a you'd get a check for that when you got back. They didn't necessarily need receipts unless it was something big or something. But it was instant. I never even noticed. But on all the government travel orders is miscellaneous expenses. So it's like if you're chewing gum or, you know, I don't know, something you needed to give a tip to somebody, whatever it was, $3 a day. And they could not zero that out. I don't know why they didn't. <laughs> But they, I'm sure they tried with great effort at the government accounting office, but they did not. So you got a check for $3 a day for every day you were in space. And it was considered a reimbursement. So it was tax-free. <laughs> wow. so that's a tax-free $3 <laughs> a day God. per day. Big so, baller. Massive yeah. bonus. Yeah. So, Mike, this has been awesome. Yeah. yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Thank, yeah. thank you for stopping by. Thank you. Yeah, great, yeah, great, you. great conversation. Great time. Hope people check out your books. So. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, Moonshot goes on sale. December 5th. Awesome. awesome. Thank, you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, guys.